What's up, Bonds Magi, crooked politicians, and stage actors? Welcome back to the Fantasy Files podcast, the podcast that wastes hours of your life that you will never get back. We are your dastardly co-hosts, Spencer and Sam, and today we'll be talking about the third book in the Gentleman Bastards series, The Republic of Thieves by Scott Lynch. Now, we mentioned this before, but just in case you're new here, uh, this series has a lot of cursing in it, so this episode might be filled with that uh, more so than usual just because of like all the quotes that we'll be reading and stuff, so just be aware of that going into this. Uh, but if you'd like to curse at us, you can reach out through any of our socials linked in the description below or support us over on Patreon, which gets you exclusive access to watch these episodes live as they're being recorded. Uh, but with all that out of the way, let's talk about the Republic of Thieves. Um, and, you know, we we usually talk about, you know, what we've been reading lately and stuff, but we've been pretty slammed with these Gentleman <laughs> Bastards books, so there really hasn't been anything else. Um, I was just telling you about Louder Milk, the show that I've been watching. I think every, I'm not going to go through the whole bit again, but everybody should go go watch that show. It's it's awesome. <laughs> Um, and then I guess a quick announcement before we really get into it. We passed a thousand subscribers. We're going to make a, uh, like an actual video at some point where we, we kind of talk about it a little bit more. Um, and we'll be doing a live stream, um, sometime in the future. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure when, uh, we have so much scheduled right now, but maybe we could do, like a live stream on a Saturday and an episode on a Sunday or something, but we'll, we'll do something for the one K celebration, no doubt. Um, but I just want to take a quick moment to thank everybody who came out and supported us. I made a couple posts like going from we're at nine 95 all the way up to like nine 99. I'm like, we're so <laughs> close. And then all these people came in and subscribed. And so I think we're at like a thousand twenty now or something. Wow. Um, so thank you guys so much for, for <laughs> supporting us and getting us over that, uh, thousand subscriber mark. We really appreciate that. But yeah, with that, we're pretty much going to go straight into the book. Um, because there's not much else to talk about. Maybe if Gabe was here, we'd have like a little back and forth beforehand, but let's just talk about Republic of Thieves and we're gonna, we're gonna spoil the hell out of it. So if you haven't read this book, um, you know, this, this is one I, I, I said last time that the second book was one where I'm like, yeah, if you don't care about the spoilers, you can just join us. But this one, like, I, I think you should just read and experience for yourself. So if you haven't yeah. read it. If you're going to read the third book and you have not read it yet, do not read the back of the book. Yes, good point. We plot for the whole book for you, which is what happened yep. to me. I was so upset. Yeah. <laughs> when you when you sent me the picture of that, I was like, why the fuck is she reading the back of the book? Stop. I always read the back of the book. Why? <laughs> I need some sort of just like... If you're in a series... And you're reading book by book. Why would you read the back of the next one? You're going to read the next one. Know. I was like, so what are we in for? I didn't think it was going to spoil the whole plot. Yeah. Like talk about like a Cliff's Notes of like yeah. the whole book right there. And yep. I, we had just gotten off the stream. Yep. I took it out because I'm like, let me get started. And then I read it and I was so upset. Yeah. I said, you gave a picture and I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. I yep. go, Everything I've been wanting to know and was excited to finally like have revealed to me in this book was just revealed on the back. <laughs> yep. That it's it's the stupidest back of the book description I've we, ever seen. I'm like, how, how... Are you gonna keep a character that under wraps with so oh, little information God. and then put on the back of the book ev every single thing yeah. that you've been wondering. I, I I what was the thought process behind that? It was so fucking stupid. I was so like so livid bad. when I saw that. Like <laughs> I, and I had just said on the podcast too. I was like, nobody tell her anything about anything. Sabatha. And it's just fucking there on the back of the book. Oh my god. So bad. I think I even looked at my husband and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? And he has no idea. Right. You know, talking about he doesn't read at all, let alone fantasy. And I'm like, yeah. Back of the book just spoiled something I've been wanting to know for. 1500 pages at this point of the other yeah. two books yep 
<laughs> oh my god. Uh, but you know that what? So it, I didn't like mind in the end because it like me and Gabe always talk about how like we're the type of people who, like peek at the back to see if like a character's really dead. Like they That's show up wild. because it makes it easier for us to like continue reading. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, in the end, it was okay, but yeah. I'm still just it just rubbed me the wrong way. I'm like, dude, oh, yeah. how are you going to keep something so under wraps? I know. <laughs> just That's just like, uh, it. It, it's almost like, it's Sorry. almost like the, uh, the marketing, like, it's almost like Lynch wasn't the person that wrote the back of the book uh -huh. description. It was some marketing guy yeah. that was like, oh, this is what the book's about. I'll put it there. Like, freaking idiot. And they were just like, we don't need to get approval from him. We're good. This yeah, is this is what the book's about, right? Like, oh There's, my god. You did not read any of the books then, did you? Because no. you would have not put that on the back of the book. Oh god, it uh, makes me so mad. So, well, so let's said. <laughs> let's start let's let's start with this. You've been waiting 3 episodes to do this. Sabatha, go. Okay, I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of them are conflicted as well because Ditto. <laughs> it reminded me a lot of um King Killer Chronicles and both chasing after Denna and mm, yeah. it almost seeming like she's playing games with him the whole time. So that was very fresh in my mind. Like the whole time I was reading it, I was like, this reminds me so much of Quoth and Denna. And I hated Denna. Can I don't I... know if Yeah. Okay, just a just a quick comment yeah. on that. First of all, totally agree. But I think it took me a while to realize that like Denna, like I hate Denna. Like I think she is actually <laughs> playing games with Quoth. But Sabatha, I don't I don't think she's playing games with him because and it took me a while to realize this. Mm -hmm. I don't think she's playing games with him because it seems like she honestly has feelings for him yeah. and like wants to pursue them. Yeah. But she's just like conflicted in her head about like like should she want him or like is does she feel like she's being forced into something because of proximity like like she's she's trying to deal with all this stuff in her head and and it's super frustrating it's super frustrating yeah. for the reader but i gotta give it to lynch i'm like it's pretty real like i've i've definitely dated girls where they've had like like you know we've been hanging out for a long time and then we're starting to pursue like a romantic thing and it's like well do we really want to do this like we need to think about this a little bit more and like i need to figure out exactly how my feelings are mm -hmm. and stuff and so you know despite despite it being really 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 frustrating especially in certain scenes that i'm sure we'll get to uh i thought i thought it was it was done a lot better than Denna just playing games with oh, both, I feel like. absolutely. And I think the way he set it up where they're in this competition, so there is mm -hmm. this thing hanging over their head making it more complicated was a brilliant way yeah. to have them be in proximity. You know, yeah. of each other. again, I thought it was a very brilliant way to do it because mm -hmm. it kept the, that guard up, although... Yeah. The thing that frustrated me with Locke is like, I'm not a girl who would go for a guy that's just like, I love you, I love you, I love mm, you. No matter what you do, I'll always love you. That to me is just, mm -mm, no. I know, it's so... <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you got, you know, Sa uh, Sabatha, uh, or Sab how do you say Sab Sabatha? Sabatha. And, you know, she's got this inner conflict going on because... From when they were young, you know, she had gone away for a summer, comes back, and Locke is this new boy and seems to be, like, in charge of the gentleman bastards. Right. And she kind of realized, like, oh, you know, I'm not the one in charge. I guess I thought I was going to be the one in charge, and look how loyal everyone is to Locke now. Yeah. And so she's very, like, she needs that. She, she wants what Locke has, and she really struggles with, I think, just, like, not being number one <laughs> yeah and and the interesting part about that too is i i really loved that discussion between them because sabatha she wasn't just like pitching a fit like she wasn't just like yeah. um like well i wanted to be the one in charge it was more like i i do want to be the one in charge but even if you were to go to them and say sabatha is the one in charge now you've developed this rapport and this friendship with them that 
it doesn't just go away. Like the even like even if you handed that off to me, there's yeah. no way for them to get past the the mental thing of oh, Locke's the one that comes up with the plans. Mm-hmm. Like there's just no good way around it. So at the end of the day, she's like, there's nothing that either of us can really do about it. But I just wanted you to recognize that that's what's going on. I just want to know that you're not like egotistically taking over the gentleman bastards. Yeah. And they, I think it a started when they're getting initiated on the, what is it? The orphans moon. And they yeah. both step forward and, and, uh, Sabatha absolutely thinks it's going to be her. And like, they choose lock. And I think that was kind of the final realization yes. nail in the coffin of like, Oh, like even chains sees yeah. it that way. That right. he's the future and- barista, you know, of, and what a what a stupid move on Locke's part where he, you know, he was kind of wishy-washy about it. He was like, yeah, maybe that's something I'd like to pursue. But Sabatha was like, no, I want this so bad. And then he comes in like, actually, yeah, I want it. And it's like, and he, in his dumb little head, he thinks that's going to impress her. But really, it's just pissing her off because he's taking the trophy. One more that thing. She, yeah. One more oh, thing. Oh, my taking. God. Yeah, yeah I, I think honestly, Spence, that this this might have been my favorite one. I this, thought it this, would be. This might have, might have easily been my yeah. favorite one. It had a very clear cut storyline. The way that he put the two stories overlapping each other, um, it wasn't nearly as confusing as book two. Book two right. was really hard to follow at times. Um, and he had me so invested in both timelines Time yep. that by the time I would finish with one. And I would start the next chapter. I would be confused for a second. Wait, wait, wait. That wasn't the present. That was the past. Now I'm in the present. Like, Mm -hmm. not because of his writing. He just had me so invested and involved in both storylines that coming out of it and having to go back to the other one, I had to, like, sit for a second and be like, okay, this is where we left off before. This is what we're coming back to. I need to remind myself, like, what I read a chapter ago. Um, Brilliant. It was a brilliant book. It really was. It was so good. What so? What did you think of? Um, so when when Locke and Sabatha start to turn the corner, like he, like in the child timeline, Chain sends them out because he's like, "You guys are cooped up in this house. You're driving me crazy. I'm gonna send you to go learn how to be actors." Um, and at first, there's like this tension, and she kind of. Um, you know, she she tells him like, you know, we're we're not getting along right now. Like, none of us are getting along right now. I don't really want to talk to any of you. Like, let's just read this script that I picked up and just enjoy the ride over there. But then when they get there, or maybe it was like halfway there or something, um, Locke has this moment with Sabatha mm-hmm. where he, because up to this point they've it's kind right of played they coy. Left. What's it was that? right before they left when they had gotten the wagons together and they were spending the one night before the caravan leaves. Is that then when he, he lays it all out for her? He finally is like, what, what, come on. Yeah. Because <laughs> they go I, to like pick up food or supplies together and that's when he, right. he lays it all out. Okay. Yeah. I, I, love, I love these moments because even though it is kind of like, ew, gross, Locke, like, stop being so infatuated. <laughs> it's also, it's also like, you can tell that Scott Lynch did such a good job of, like, writing from the perspective of, like, a younger teenager, probably, I forget what they are, like, 14, 15, 16, um, and just, like, laying his complete heart, like, open to bear. Yeah. And... Yeah. It's it just came across so like true and honest and I just I loved it even though it was like oh lock okay it it was still like yeah. oh man it's so kind of moving <laughs> you know what stuck with me from one of the moments where they're talking and you know my son is gonna be seven in November and um, Sabatha says to Lock like what do you mean you were like a dirty little like six year old run yeah. orphan, you know and i just like looked over at my son who is currently six and yeah. and couldn't just stop thinking like oh my god like trying to picture him as like an orphan on the streets who's already like pickpocketing and stealing and living this just hard life it really 
softened me to lock in a lot of ways. Not that I wasn't, but it really made me be like, oh my God, well, I have this beautiful, happy child at home, but of course he wouldn't be that way if he was living the life that Locke had to live. And it really put me in like the mindset of like what they all went through as as children. And it definitely softened me to a lot of them and like was was willing to be more forgiving for a lot of the things that they do. Yeah, (laughs) for sure. He has so few things that are his and he wants Sabbath on he's like I'm holding on to you I'm not letting go like right. you are the one and that's it and you know I, I can understand with your childhood trauma yeah. that you can end up like that so yeah I loved I love just like the uh, as much as I hate like insta love tropes and fantasy I'm like I kind of love just the the romantic um, not interpretation <laughs> yeah the romantic notion of just like lock you know, going out for a hanging day and, like, they're going to go steal stuff and her, like, hat falls off and her red hair spills out and he's just, like, instantly, like, in love. I'm like, oh, that's so cute. Yeah. And uh, A little of, like, my husband where it wasn't love at first sight, but when I first saw him, I looked at my girlfriends and did you ever do the, like, dibs game? No. Maybe it's a New England thing. Okay. When people want things, we'll call dibs. And who's ever the last to like, or the first to say dibs and touch their nose gets it. Okay. <laughs> my husband walked into this like party we were at and I just looked at my girlfriends and I was like, dibs, 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 dibs. dibs, dibs. <laughs> and it was, it just took off from there. You know what I mean? That's so funny. I wouldn't say I was in love with him, but sure. there was something and I knew and I was like, dibs, mine. Yeah. Mine. <laughs> yeah. I think, I, I think that kind of, that happens a lot even if it's not love at first sight there there is some sort of connection that people can't really explain Mm -hmm. that when you see someone for the first time it's kind of like you just you kind of you know to some extent that they're going to be that you're attracted to them but they're also probably going to have like an attractive personality you're like i want to know more (laughs) right yeah there there's some sort of like instant intrigue yeah yeah. <clears throat> um so let's so let's go through I just want to talk about I, I just want to keep talking about Sabatha. So Me too. Because <laughs> was... I am just like I'm not like <laughs> black or white with her. I'm very like gray. I go back and forth on different things with her. Because right. even in the past ones that they're talking about, I'm like, she's a young girl. Like she's mm-hmm. a young girl, you know what I mean? And even later it's like the life that she lived and the plans that she thought she had and they didn't come to fruition and yeah she's had to make her own way so i i was very forgiving a lot of the things that she did yeah i i think that i i probably wasn't forgiving at all the first time i read through this book but like maybe over the past couple of rereads i've gotten a lot more forgiving of her and <clears throat> i think that um, you know, I think there there is some things that I wish was like a little bit more fleshed out. Like I wish, I I really wish that we had Sabatha POV chapters because yes. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think I think that a lot of the times where she's telling Locke something like, um, like with the whole him becoming the leader thing. At first, you don't really understand what she's getting at or what she wants from him. Like, and, think it over, and you'll start to realize what I meant, and come back to me. You yeah, know, we'll talk. Yeah, and I think, I think even even after that, it's kind of like, okay, so like, was it ever like hinted at before that she wanted to be the leader of this gang? Is there any like like foreshadowing that we can fall back on? And so I think it would have been nice to have like a pov chapter or two of sabatha just so we could understand a little bit more about how she thinks because when she tells Locke, like you'll figure it out you just have to think about it like you know me well enough you just have to think about it and you'll figure it out but we as the reader don't know her well enough to figure it out Mm -hmm. and so it would have been nice just to have like a chapter where we get to know her and her desires a little bit more so that we could follow along. See, I felt it was a conscious, like Scott Lynch did it on purpose. He did that consciously because when Locke shows up, she's not there. 
So we don't know what the, the general ambassadors look like before he got there. And right, my right. assumption was is she was the leader. She was, sure. you know, the obvious leader because they've always said Calo and Galdo, Calo and Galdo, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, were never meant to be like the leaders. It was very obvious they were meant to be, you know, always just the people yeah. who are behind the leader and helping them. And so yeah. I took it as just, she came back and suddenly she had been like replaced essentially. Yeah, that's fair. That's, that's but I would fair. I would have liked her thought process more. Again, I think it was a conscious decision by Scott Lynch because the whole time we're reading about the competition, um, you don't know if her motives are genuine or not. Yeah. You know what I right. mean? So I felt it was a conscious decision on his part to not give us that. Especially, especially after the initial, um, like when they meet and he like kisses her behind the ear yes. and it, it's like a poison. It's like, Oh wait, is she totally like given up on these guys? And like, just like she, like she's just using them for anything yeah. she has. And I don't know where I, I would be interested to get a woman's perspective on what Sabatha did there, because I think I'm with Locke where I'm like, yeah, like even if it's a game like that, like that's pretty fucked up to use like these this romantic entanglement to your advantage. I don't know. <laughs> I, I understand feeling that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I from Locke's point of view. Yes. But at the end of the day. She's always been second fiddle to Locke. This is her chance to actually like compete with him and see mm. who is like the better, better in her mind, you know, right. leader essentially, who can really, you know, get things done. Um, yeah. And she hasn't seen him in a really long time. And I felt for her, it was like, and she did say like, as he's passing out, like, just remember everything I said, like I meant it, I do love you, you know, blah, 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 blah. And he's had the gang until people died. You know, he still has John. Yeah. Um, but she's really been out on her own. And for her, I think this was mentally m more important to win than it was for Locke. Like, yes, yeah. Locke in a way was like, does my life depend on this? Okay. But for Sabatha, it was more of proving to herself that, you know, she is equal or better yeah. to Locke. And so I... I sympathized with her a, a lot because of it, because I kept sure. trying to be like, what would it be like to like be in this close knit group and family? And like, you thought you guys were all going to be together forever. And then you're not. And he stays with the group and you're out on your own and you're a woman and you're yeah. a redhead. And we found out the nasty details of what happens to clean redheaded children. That was. Yeah. Brutal. To read. Um, and so I, I, I was able to put myself in her shoes a lot easier than mm. I've been with a lot of characters I read. I sympathized with her greatly because she was an orphan. She was in the same position as them. And if you look at who walked away with what initially, you know, Locke won. Right. So right. this was really, but did we ever find out like what was on the line for her? Like why was... she to win this? I was just about to ask that because I don't think we do and I wish we had because I don't think we'll get an opportunity to learn later um, but she said she was whispering to him and she's like we have to actually do this because both of our lives yeah she, or she said she's like you have no idea what they have over me both of us are both of our lives are on the line if we yeah. do not play this straight um, and so I would guess that they were holding Locke's life over her <gasps> like i i think that's what it was that it, is that's that's the only thing she has right she doesn't have anything else oh my god i think that's it Spence, that's so smart i would never have come up with that on my own but now that you say it i'm like that makes what is what does she care about the only thing she cares about really right. is lock and she says at one point like i tried to not have feelings for you anymore i tried to move on i went yeah it took me forever to you know feel like i was coming out from under your thumb um yeah that would make a lot of sense that yeah that, i like that i like right. that one yeah I, I think she also because she left a huge mess behind her in ember lane and i think a lot of it was was the bonds magi like cleaning all that up um and so there may have also been like a hey we'll send you straight to the court of ember lane if you 
you know, don't do this yeah. right. That might have been. And she it said as well. she'd done like a bunch of cons herself, sometimes on nobles and and yeah. stuff like that. So she's definitely got a past that could be yeah problematic. Like locks, I, it has to be. There's no way it couldn't be. Mm-hmm. So she's definitely got skeletons in her closet as well. How long have they been apart? Because uh, we don't five. Agree in oh, well, the flashbacks, five we years. Didn't ever find the moment right where they split up, where she leaves them. No, we haven't seen that yet, but he says that it's been five years. Okay, okay. Um, so I think that she she stayed with them into, like, her early 20s. Because I think I they're all... I died, and he took over as was, like, the final straw for another thing we don't know. You know, what... Chains yeah. probably just had an old age, I would assume, but... Yeah. We don't know. <laughs> yeah, she, she said that as well. She's like, I couldn't... I couldn't just, like, sit there and let you be, like another father chains like that that felt so weird and it's like yeah I, I get that well how crazy was it when she says um it really made me think where she says chains did us a disservice yeah that was a great us conversation have a heart and have a conscience because in our line of work that could be the nail in your coffin to kill you right. and when she pointed that out i was like oh Mm-hmm. She's she's kind of right, you know. Yeah. Like in your line of service, like look at Locke and Jean. They are very easily played against each other. Like, okay, we're not going to kill you, Locke. We're going to yeah. torture Jean in front of you, and they're both willing to do anything to keep the other from coming right. to harm. So I was like, wow, yeah, that that hit hard. <laughs> yeah, that was that was pretty good. I like that conversation for sure, but. Oh, yeah. Speaking of uh, what she left behind in Ember Lane. uh, So the next book, whenever it's finished, is called The Thorn of Ember Lane. And I have a feeling that um, that Locke and Jean and possibly Sabatha are going to be going back to Ember Lane for some reason. There's some some way they'll get pulled back there because we learn so much about Ember Lane in this book um, where the king when we first hear about it the king is about to die and he's told his court that they will have to figure out the next king after he dies he's not gonna he's not gonna pick one yeah and so then about halfway through the book we get a town crier being like the king of ember lane is dead like the the whatever it is region or country or whatever of ember lane is in a civil war and they're all fighting each other for the chance to be king. And the cover of Thorn of Emberlane, the cover's already been made. That's how crazy this whole situation yeah, I is. it's so weird. I looked it up and I was like, wait, I thought the book wasn't out. Like, I was so confused. But it's been 10 years since book three, right? Yep. Has and he had any updates on... Yeah, so now you can watch that interview. And he'll he'll talk about that a bit. He's... It, it sounds like it's coming like I hate to be like the hopeful guy because I'm I'm usually not like with Patrick with, like, Ross just burned uh, me on that yeah like, I'm like I can't trust anyone I'm, anymore <laughs> I know I'm like with with the third book of King Killer I'm like nah it's never coming out with Winds of Winter I'm like nah it's never coming out never coming. but with but with this one Scott Lynch has done a pretty good job of like staying up to date with his audience and like talking to them um and from that interview, it sounds like he's in the final, like the final draft, final editing phase. And so hopefully we see it, we know, within the next couple of years. Well, um, we did get good news with The Will of the Many, book two, has like a tentative yes. kind of date. And I think um, Empire of the Damned, Kristoff, uh, I think he yeah. has submitted his final draft for book three. Yeah, that's coming very soon as well. Yeah. So exciting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those are two uh those are two books that I'm like very excited about. Very excited about. But I have to say though, honestly though, I'm almost grateful at the moment that there's not a book four because I need a little bit of a break at this sure. point from yeah, these yeah. books. I'm just like, it has consumed me for the last like four yeah. weeks. <laughs> and I'm like, I just need to switch it up like a little yep. bit. A little yep. bit. That's very that's the hardest Potter. <laughs> that's the hardest part about the podcast sometimes is like if you find a series you really like, then you want to cover the whole trilogy because you don't want to read the first book and then forget what happens. Yeah. You want to do them like back to back to back, but 
if you're making content around it especially it's like you know if you're like trying to just like check them off a list it can be very like taxing that was Um, when i really stopped doing my book instagram is it became more of a chore at this point where i felt like i had to get things done to post about it and it wasn't fun anymore and thankfully you know i found you guys on twitter and you know it's really opened this like new door of things that i actually really really enjoy doing yeah for I sure to talk I, I love to talk and instagram is so caption based and what catches people's eye and this is more mentally nourishing to me than right. any of that ever was <laughs> yeah for sure um but yeah so hopefully uh you know hopefully you know that comes out soon hopefully we get some more information i know that he has um two short stories that are ready to go and he's going to be releasing those pretty soon here from what it sounds like um and and they're going to take place in between book three and four and so it'll be like a little bit of a bridge um but the cover of the fourth book is a battlefield and it's Mm -hmm. that it's you know whoever the characters on the cover are that's them in in supposedly Ember Lane. Oh, interesting. And so Do you I want... think they're gonna all end up back together. Do you think? I think so. You think yeah. so? I mean, I, I would hope so. <laughs> yeah, I I would think you know the the ending that we get in this book where Sabatha like runs away. I think there's something patience isn't telling us. I think that Sabatha is running to go do something to keep Locke out of trouble. So she didn't actually leave because of something Patience said. It was more like she, or well, in regards to Locke. Right. Yeah. I, and I and I, I have no idea. I don't really have any theory to like back this up with. It, it could just be her like freaking out and running for all I know, but I just, that my, is her thing. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely is her thing. But just like my gut tells me that I think I think her running away is somehow to save Locke and John. That's really good. I really like that. I I really like that. I mean, I just got a little confused because I thought I was very confused with like what Patience said. Like, you yeah. don't know who you are, your true name, and what the the story was behind it. And so it didn't have the effect on me that I thought it would. It. it so this is. So pretty much this alone is why the third book is not my favorite book. And it's, it's, it's what a lot of people have. A lot of people take issue with this book because it's like, man, we were reading a story about just like a normal human guy that was like really good at thieving. And it was like very, like, despite the fantasy aspects, it was very like down to earth and now you're introducing this idea that Locke is like some bonds mage. Like what? Like but uh, he like went dark and figured out he could switch into a new body, but he chose a body that wasn't a bonds mage. And now he, he can't remember his previous no life. Memories, and that's why you're obsessed with redheads because your wife that had died was a, was redhead. a redhead. Yeah. And I thought it was like a really pointed thing at Sabatha, like, and the way she freaked out about it and was like, oh, is that why? I'm like, come on. Like, I know. <laughs> I come know. On. Like, are you looking? She dissects Locke's words so I much. I know. Like, you're looking for a reason. Yeah, and he you says know, that. Which does make sense in a way, though. Yeah. To me, because I think at the end of the day, Sabatha doesn't want to get hurt. She doesn't want to be dependent on Locke. And I feel like in some ways she thinks that by being with him would almost be losing in a way like yeah. she's she's giving something up by being with him and it's like what has lack ever done other than want you to be you and loved you despite any flaws or faults right wholeheartedly. yeah so um it was that was like a little hard for me but i'm also someone who until i met my husband i never dated because anytime i liked a guy as soon as he liked me back i freaked out and was like oh my god i don't like you like this is too weird i, I, I don't like this um yeah so i could relate somewhat in some ways to the fear of commitment uh that was a very real like thing i have dealt with in my life um so i can understand it but the way that she just like ran away all the time and kept misconstruing the things that Locke said and making this like big deal out of it that kind of pissed me off (laughs) 
It's but we're it, in Locke's head, so we know his intentions. Right. Yes, that's the other thing. We we know <laughs> we know his intentions, and I think the thing that is probably well written about Sabatha is that um, you know she's reacting the way that. I mean, I don't pretend to know what someone like this would be like, but mm -hmm. she's potentially reacting the way that a child growing up on the streets and having to steal for every meal and like, you know, you she's expecting anyone. Yeah, she's <laughs> expecting everyone to screw her over. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that that was probably like on purpose, you know, like it was probably meant to be that. But that being said, there, there are so many moments where I was so incredibly frustrated with Sabatha, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead into one of my notes here. I want to ask you, you know, the build up over the past two books um, of where's Sabatha, where's Sabatha, where's Sabatha, and me telling you, oh, it's, it's gonna be great, just you wait. What, yeah. what is your what is your reaction to finally meeting her here? Like, was it worth it or was it? It felt very unnecessary. I, mm, I, okay. it didn't seem like there was this, essentially, we didn't find out what broke them up in the first place. What made her leave the gentleman bastards? Well, we uh, did. So she, she, uh, she didn't want to be there when he, while he was like, trying to carry on Chains's tradition. He's like, nope, it's been this way. It's always going to be this way. We're just going to keep running the gentleman bastards how we've okay, always done it. Okay. And she wanted to change it up. She's like, what? Chains is dead. Why don't we leave? Like, why don't we go travel the world and all this stuff? And he's like, no, we got to keep Chains's memory alive. And she's like, I don't really want to do that. And they left being like, I still love you, but I, like, Sabatha needs to go and Locke needs to stay. Yeah, and that's kind of well, where they left it. Well, I forget what book it was brought up, and if it was this one or the last one, where they're like, "You could have taken all of that money and lived like a, a handsome lifestyle," but no, you like the drama. You like yep. constantly having, you know, a problem to solve. Um, it's that it's like he's a drama queen in a way. Yeah. You know what I mean? He and I can't... think, yeah, go ahead. It, it's just um, I forget where I was going with it, but I think. He needs the drama and he needs the drama and it's like if you had decided not to need the drama and taken that money you guys could have bought an estate you could have run little cons wherever you yeah. want for the rest of your life but right. you always have to go big yeah and you end up in all of these other problems and situations and then how can you be upset when this is you could have settled you could have right. gone you and lived a happy life oh uh. It's That's so the frustrating part for me. <laughs> it's so sad. And I think that is, um, you know, now that we're at the third book, looking back, I think, you know, you, you may read the first book and be like, oh yeah, that had like a good life lesson. But mm -hmm. then getting to the third book and seeing everything, it's like, oh, the first book like really hits hard now because you realize that he could have, like, he had so many options. He had so many things that he so could have done. <laughs> and he chose to take that store of money and keep gambling and gambling and gambling and gambling until he gets fucked over by Caparaza and the Midnighters and all of these people who, and the Bonds Mage, who just destroy his life. And it's like, dude, you could have just quit have while you were point. ahead. You could have had all your guys still, and yeah. you wouldn't have. It. So, did you say it's Bonds Mag Bonds Magi? Because I was saying Bond Magi. I think in my head think, the whole time. I think either are fine. Okay, um, no, because I always get Sabbath wrong. So, I oh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, up until the last ten pages, I was like, oh, are they like now done done with the Bonds Magi? Like they don't have to worry about them anymore. They're basically good. And then after reading. Yeah. The final 10 pages, I was like, Jesus fucking Christ. Jesus like, fucking Christ is right. <laughs> it's like, it's not a fair battle to me yeah. at all because oh, yeah. of the power imbalance and what they can do. And they know Jean's real name. And now they know, well, they sort of know Locke's real name, but apparently now he has some secret name only known to him, but he can't remember it. And, right. um, but now, you know, can we say it? Can we, can we say the end? The, the Falconer yeah. is definitely coming for his ass. Like, yes. And he's fucking insane.
that I thought was a really good uh, twist. There's, so there's really there, good. So there's three major things that happen in this book, right? There's the um, we find out, or three major plot twists, I should say. We find out that Locke is a Bonds mage. We find out that the Eldrin ran away, supposedly because of this dark force that's out in space well, somewhere that the Bonds soon. mages. Yeah. And they don't know for sure, but that's like, I don't think it would be mentioned if it wasn't like a thing. Yeah. And and then the Falconer getting his powers back and probably even more so than before. And the first two, I hate with a passion because I, I don't like that Locke is like, at some point you just know he's going to unlock his Bonds Mage abilities and he's going to be able to use magic. You just know that that's the way it's going. And then the second thing with the Eldrin, it's like, I really don't want there to be this big bad guy. Like besides like someone like the Falconer, like I don't want I don't want this to turn into like epic fantasy. I liked my grim dark thief story. It I'm didn't like, fit. It, yeah. it didn't fit. I was so confused when they told the story of who Locke really was, and I had to sit for a second to be like that's that came out of nowhere in a way that yeah. this story did not have. It's like this time I read this book um gallon and spoiler alert um i thought it was just like a mystery book and then you get to the last like, 50 pages and it turns out to be this paranormal thing and i was so fucking oh. pissed off because i was ready for this like amazing explanation for why everything had happened and then they just made it paranormal and it was like oh well that explains it and i'm like yeah. no because ghosts <laughs> because ghosts it's because ghosts and there's this like ghost realm and blah, blah 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 and it reminded me of that in a way where i was like that came out of left field yeah nothing at this point gave any indication that these things were possible and right. it felt like a you Deus should have given more little breadcrumbs at least along the way to make it not be like what the fuck yeah that's that's exactly how i feel i think that i would not i would not mind it probably at all if it had just been set up like if if it had been from the first book like there's this thing that's constantly on Locke's mind and he's like where did I come from? Like, who are my parents? Why don't I remember any of these things? If that had been set up, yeah. I would have way less of an issue. Random memories that might keep popping yes, up. Yes, that would be Where great. are these coming from? And yeah. Anything, anything even little. Right, <laughs> I, mean. I know. <laughs> and, and you just know that now in the next books, we're going to start getting that. Like, we're going to start getting Locke, like having little memories and stuff. And it's like, well, you should have done it before. Um, and so there I was would... no lead up to it whatsoever. It was like, oh, hey, yeah. here's what you are. And you had nobody could have guessed this in any way because we gave you no context or clues. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, there's there's a lot of authors where I'm like, I I wouldn't like to interview them because I'm afraid that I would come off to like antagonistic if I was yeah. asking them questions like that. But Lynch is like the one author where I feel like I could in a non-antagonistic manner i could like ask him about these things and just be like like where like where was the foreshadowing for this or was this something that you decided later i would love to ask him because you couldn't this... go back at that point and like yeah. add it in, but right if that was your plan the whole time which i have to assume you had some sort of plan for his identity i thought yeah. it was more going to be that like you know he was like a king's son or right yeah something. that would have been like, more welcome yeah. And so when we found out he was a dark magi who got into bad arts after, you know, going crazy from losing his love. I mean, it did make a little sense to me, his obsession with Sabatha, if sure. this all turns out to be true. It sort of did in a way make sense to me, um, that part. But the rest of it, I was just like, I, 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 I couldn't have guessed this in yeah. any way. And then you kind of, but you can't trust anything that they say. So well, I'm like, here's, here's the thing though, is I think that he did himself a big disservice and I bet he's kicking himself for this. Like Ooh. I would guarantee you that Lynch kicks himself for this every day. Um, because this third book came out, everybody had the same reaction of like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. And, um, and I think that is what, 
is causing Lynch to take so long on this next book because he's like, how the fuck do I write myself out of this? Nobody likes this. And the one thing that locks him into this decision, there's one one scene that makes this irreversible is that, um, you know, the intercept scenes where we see like the Bonds mages behind the scenes and they're like yeah, talking to each other. Yeah, those were a little confusing for me. I think I need to go back now that I finished the yeah, book. Yeah, I would, yeah. Because there, there's a lot of information in them. And in one of them, it's after Locke and Sabatha get told about Locke's true identity or whatever. And we see mages who are not patients or part of her crew. And yeah. they're like... Um, Oh, Lamora can't this? Like that makes so much sense. Like and they because before you would have been able to be like, okay, so Jean told her the name Lamora Canthus, which is the name that Locke told him in the previous book. And that's so, what I'm he heard when he they were in the mist and whatnot. Yeah. And so it's like it's like, okay, so maybe Patience just took that name from Jean and is using that against Locke and be like, I know your name. How else would I know it if I didn't know this thing? But, like, really, she just got it from Jean? But the other Bonds mage who is not involved with Patience in any way also knows the name. Well, and, and, and so what's he's like, the name? Lamora Canthus, Lamora. Yeah, right. And it, it does fit. It, yeah. It, it does. And so just, I just, I just don't, <laughs> I, I don't think that there's any way that he can write himself out of this. I think that he has to, I think he has to write it this way and write it really, really, really well. Like, mm -hmm. I think, I think that, you know, whatever he does from here on out has to be, it has to work around. perfectly. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise it's going to be really, really bad. But and it's I, really sad for the authors though, right, in general, yeah. because me and my sister were talking about the other day. Um, she was saying, like, I couldn't do podcasts because, you know, one bad comment would, like, ruin me, you know? Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine being an author and you put, like, your heart and soul yeah. and so much time into these books and characters and people just shitting on what is supposed to be this big reveal. And you're like, what the fuck, dude? Right, like <laughs> yeah. Well, I think... And I, I agree, it's got to be difficult. I, I recorded a video um, a couple months ago that I haven't posted yet. I've been meaning to go and edit it and post it. But I talk about the relationship between readers and authors and what the responsibilities of each are. And the readers don't have much of a, res of a responsibility, but I think reviewers have a responsibility to critique something fairly as unbiased as possible and to look at something and say uh kind of like i i know people are probably going to be on board with me saying this but like the like what i said about fourth wing i was like mm -hmm. the book is enjoyable like it's yeah. it's fun but if you look at the writing there are problems with the writing itself mm -hmm. and i think critiquing something in a fair way is the responsibility of the reviewer yeah. And then the responsibility of, and even, even like your favorite books, like as a reviewer, like you shouldn't be looking at your favorite books and being like, nope, it's perfect. Like you should be able to look at it and be like, no, it's got these issues and these issues, which is why when I posted that video recently where I said, uh, I made a video saying the lies of Locke Lamora, the first book specifically is a masterpiece. And I went through each category and talked about like why I think each each thing it does is done so perfectly. And that video got a ton of views because my other reviews are nitpicking like my favorite books, like even my favorite books, I nitpick them and I talk about the things that I don't like. And so when when I have a thought of like, no, I think this book is perfect, that stands out more and I think it's more honest. Um, but that being said, so that's the responsibility of the reviewer. The responsibility of the author, and this is also going to be a very unpopular opinion, but I think the responsibility of the author is to look at reviews and see how mm -hmm. people are dissecting your work, at least the fair ones. Like, at least look at the people that are fairly critiquing your work and have an honest conversation with yourself and say, could I have done that better? Like, are they right? 
and I think that you know if you look at something like the the MCU like the Marvel movies uh-huh. they're not paying attention to the audience at all they're just making whatever movies they want to throw at the wall and the fans yeah. are like we don't like this and same with Star Wars and so I think as an author obviously it's a much smaller scale than like the MCU or Star Wars but I I think in order to avoid the pitfalls of MCU and Star Wars fatigue, you have to look at at least at least the reviews that are the most honest and fair and try to decide if you've misstepped somewhere. Well, and I agree a lot with like, especially as a reviewer, like I'm never going to go on and be like, I fucking hated this book. It was shit. You know, (laughs) I didn't come out with you know, this part bothered me because of like A, B, and C, and this is why, and I didn't think it fits with the story and yada, yada, yada. Um, That's why I don't like to go to on Reddit. I have a couple book subreddits that I'm in, um, and I don't really like it because there will be people who claim they're fans of a series, and then they just completely shit on it and are like, it was terrible, it was horrible, and I'm like, you're still reading it for whatever reason you're on book six and you're still reading it you're still going yeah you have some attachment to it and while you could have valid criticisms like if you don't have a single nice thing to say about it what are what are you doing here are you just one of those people who gets off on shitting on other people yeah i i think there's definitely some some channels like that i i hate to to call out another YouTuber in the same space as us, but I've I've talked about it on the podcast before. I have had trouble watching uh, Matt's fantasy reviews because I've often felt like, um, and and if he ever wants to come talk on the channel, I'd be more than willing to to chat with him. But mm-hmm. I I think that he has a tendency to look at to look at the most popular things and just shit on them. And he did that with the cradle series. Now I'm not a big fan of the cradle series, but I read through all of them with Gabe and there were certain things that I really enjoyed. And I talked about that in our podcast episodes and there were some things that I didn't like, but Matt, the whole, like all across the board, he read through the whole series and he shit on every single book. And I was like, why? Why are why you reading it, it then? <laughs> if you hated the first four books, why are you still reading it this week? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I'm someone who doesn't get caught up on plot holes as much sure. as some. I know some people do. You probably do a little bit now. <laughs> yeah, I, I do from time to time. But for the most part, I tell people. Like I, I am the most forgiving of, uh, or I, I am probably one of the most willing participants of benefit of the doubt yes. or like, or like mm-hmm. a, not benefit of the doubt, um, suspension of disbelief. Yeah. I, I am, I am totally on board for a suspension of disbelief. Mm-hmm. Why, why can the dragons shoot ice out of their asshole? Like uh, suspension sure. of disbelief. You know, I don't. I don't it's care. a fantasy realm. It's totally yeah. possible. <laughs> but like, I'm thinking of like, so Sarah J. Mass. It's a very girly fantasy series. She has a mm. Court of Thorns and Roses. She has Crescent City. Crescent City was her first like adult series that she did. And the what was it? The third book. I want to say the third book came out a while uh, at the beginning of the year, and people were just shitting on it online for like plot holes. This wasn't cleared up. Blah 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 blah. And, I was like, I thought it was a great book. Like, I didn't yeah. even really notice, like, these plot holes. I enjoyed the story that was being told, and I just went along with it. And it's like some people look at it as, like, this life and death matter. You know what I sure. mean? Like, oh, my God, I, I have to shit on this book so much. And I'm like, but did you enjoy anything? You know right, what I mean? yeah, yeah. I so just, what, I walked what, away and I was happy. You know what right, I mean? Right, for sure. I to nitpick it. For sure. Now, now taking that sentiment and looking at Republic of Thieves, would you say that, you know, as we're like nitpicking this ending and stuff, it, is it because Republic of Thieves is just a different kind of book than the Sarah J. Mass books, you think? Um, yeah, like, I think this is a higher caliber of book right. where the other ones to me are just for fun. Like right. they're relax reads they just they're easy i don't have to think about it but these like sorry my my mic is being held up by the last book of oh. <laughs> <laughs> these books you have to pay attention you you need to be 
critically thinking a lot throughout it. Like, why am I being told what seems like a random thought at this time, but I think is going to play a part later. And especially with these books, the back and forth of the timelines, you really have to be paying attention. So I do hold them a look to a higher sure. caliber than I do the other books. And, and I think that is a big difference. The other ones are, they're not young adult, but they feel young adult to me. And just that they're easy reads. I don't need to overthink it. Yeah. These books, like with Sabatha, I, I, I'm constantly like, oh, you're kind of annoying, but also like, if I really think about it, I do understand why you're acting and doing the things that you're doing. It makes sense. Um, yeah. It's it's a lot harder to write these books than it right. is to write the Sarah J. Moss books, in my opinion. Sure. Not saying that hers are easy to write. Sure, You know, sure. she's got three series that are now culminating. You're finding out they're all in the same universe, which oh. to me is wild because she's been writing them for what 15 to 20 years now she's got wow. some close to 20 books out um that that's it, crazy. in and of itself is phenomenal that's amazing right. but those are easy reads to me those are my comfort right. reads where this is i want More my technical mind yeah right <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fair i'm holding you to a little bit of a higher standard here and what i right and i think he delivered like i said like i thought book three when I think about it, it is my favorite book out of all yeah. of them. I, it was a book two was a little hard for me. It got a little too yeah. convoluted. There were too many plot lines going on by the end. I was just like, I just want this to be done with. Like I, I I'm over this Yeah, <laughs> and that's fair. only because I thought the initial plot was amazing of robbing the spire. And we had yeah. so much time there in the beginning. And yeah. then when, um, the Archon, yeah. Or whatever he is, wants to like double cross and he's going back and forth and using that to use them against each other. Brilliant. Right. But then he sends them out to sea and all this other crazy shit happens. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, like, this is where you needed to trim the fat. And I right. loved when they were at sea. I fucking loved right. it. But I would have loved a whole book. Right. Of them just at sea. Yeah. The, the spire should have been the second book and then the pirate should have been the third and then fourth. this should have been the fourth fourth that would have been the best way i think to do it yeah i totally agree but i loved this series like overall like i would absolutely recommend this to people i have series where people are like would you recommend it and i'm like i read them all but i don't know yeah. like it right. was okay like but i read them all so i mean something kept me going somewhat but this I would absolutely recommend these books. They were they were phenomenal. Yeah, they're they're so great. And like every time, like even if you don't like the whole like my least favorite part of the book is the whole like political game. And yeah. like I I like I like the flashbacks way more than the political game. But even that, I was like, it's still I I think it's the benefit of creating such enticing characters that it doesn't really matter what they're doing like it doesn't really matter if they're doing something that you don't find interesting as long as it's Locke and john and hopefully sabatha yeah like you're you're gonna have a good time like either way and so i think that is that is such a benefit of writing fantastic characters first and foremost that the rest of your book almost just doesn't really matter. Like, even if Locke is a Bonds mage, I'll still read whatever he does yeah. next. Like, I'll still read, you know, Locke being a Bonds mage. I'm sure it's going to yeah. be hilarious. I thought so. it was interesting. Like, I thought the whole political thing was going to be the main plot point. And honestly, it felt more of like a subplot to, to the, the flashback. Sabatha. No, yeah. to more like Locke and Sabatha in current day, oh, you know? Right, right. And how they're trying to deal with, like, competing against each other and whatnot. And I thought we were going to get so much more of mm. the political game. And I was actually pleasantly surprised and liked better yeah. that it was more this, how are we navigating each other? And here are these flashbacks that show like what kind of got us to this point in a way. And yeah, it, it was very like clear to me in this book, what right. the and the plot and how we were supposed to move along with it. Yep. And like I said, book two was just just a little too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the the politics in this book um I thought were interesting. I I think that for me, 
Um, you know, I, I, I think you're right. That like the main plot point isn't necessarily the politics. It's more about Locke and, and Sabatha wholly because yeah. the whole politics thing, it really felt like they were just kind of playing a prank war on each other. It was just like a back and forth. Like there, there was never any like major, like serious repercussions. It was yeah. just like these pranks that were going back and, and forth. And you never really found out like who all the candidates really were and how the right. districts were. Yeah, who's the candidates? And, and they just kept <laughs> playing these like pranks on each other. And granted, I think Sabatha blew Locke out of the water in almost every aspect. Um, but okay, was, that's a take. I mean, granted, she had a head start, but. I thought the the boat trick was really great. Oh, it's so the, brilliant! It the so grannies good. on the roof was really yes. great. Like, what are we gonna that do? So like good. knock them off? <laughs> <laughs> that was so brilliant. Yeah. I love that part I of the book that part, where Jean is there, like, like old grandma. <laughs> she's like, you can carry me down, kicking and screaming. I'll just climb back up later. Right? You know? Yeah. But they realize later they're like what are they really doing? They're not yeah. really like, you know, yeah. involved in this in any way. Like I thought that <laughs> was great. I kept waiting for when they were having their like dinners together, Lack and Sabatha, that something was going to happen. And I actually right. liked that neither of them it, was it willing didn't. to trick each other. Right. And that made me believe more that Sabatha actually did care about mm. Locke still, because I was like, all right, she fucked around the first time, you know, yeah. She knew they would come back. She knew they'd get off this boat, the ship, and all of that. Um, yeah. So I had been worried that she was going to try to play another, like, really weird trick. Yeah. But she's just some... Um... Girlfriend needs to figure out what she wants. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, She, like, really needs to figure out what she wants and needs to stop. It, it just pissed me off, like... If somebody knows that they have someone like on a leash, essentially, and yeah. you just keep pulling them in and letting them go and pulling them in and letting them go. And you're under the assumption that he's always going to be there. So when you finally figure your shit out, you know, he's going to be there. Yeah, what that's kind of fucked. Too far one day. But regardless, right. like, that's fucked up. Right. It's fucked up. Right. Right. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. She definitely needs to to get it figured out. And I hope that. You know, I think I think it's it's tough for me with Sabatha because I've read um the Night Angel series where Viridiana is kind of the Sabatha of yes, that series. Yes. And I like Viridiana way more because you see her character arc and you see her become like a person that you want to be around. Um and Sabatha it's just tough because we've only gotten one book with her. But we've never gotten her viewpoint on anything. Right, yeah. And so we don't really know. Like, I, I hope that she turns into a Viridiana character. I yeah. hope that, like, in this book with her, I'm like, oh, Sabatha kind of sucks. But later on, I'm like, wow, what a great turnaround for her character. Because yeah. that's what I love so much about Viridiana is that she has an incredible character. Like, honestly, one of my favorite character arcs of yeah. all time. Um, and so I hope I hope Sabatha gets that too. But I, I asked you earlier what um, so you know having gone through the first couple books and like all the anticipation and uh, seeing Sabatha now, what like I asked what your thought is on it and and you had mentioned that I wish that she had been like brought up in the first two books. Like what was the point of not bringing her up? Mm -hmm. And I think there is. A narrative reason this might be me reaching a little bit and assuming things on scott lynch's part mm -hmm. but i think that the interesting thing about sabatha is that you know you you get told so much about her in the previous books and she gets brought up but then you find out in this book like we've been saying that she kind of sucks like she's not awful but she kind of she doesn't live up to this Thing that you built up in your mind yes i was and, waiting for a much bigger like <laughs> right and and i think the brilliance of this if this is lynch's intention i think the brilliance of this is that it for the for the reader it's like super yeah. meta 
for the reader, it mirrors what Locke himself is going through because he's been going through the past few years building Sabatha up in his mind like, oh, she used to be this amazing woman that I was in love with and like all through his childhood, she's, he's like, she's this brilliant thief and I, she's amazing at everything and I love her so much. And then, uh, and then when you meet her, she's kind of just a girl. She's kind of just a woman. You know what I mean? Like, she's not like, she's not anything that's like mind blowing. And what that's would so... have made her mind blowing. You know what I mean? I was impressed with like the trick she was able to pull out. She could stay ahead of Locke, but you have to think of it as like when we first heard about it through Locke, we're hearing about like a young love. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. So it's always going to be so much bigger in his head yes. than the reality of the situation. And so that's what I kept reminding myself is this is just like a girl. Yeah. And it's a boy that's in love with her. And of course, you know, he made her sound like the most amazing woman in the world, just like Quoth and Denna. Right, you know, right. right. Like, I don't fucking like her. Yeah. I don't like her. <laughs> to me is, is a trickster in a way that I can't get on board with. Right. Um, and she's never really showed her feeling for feelings for Quoth. Um, yeah. she, she likes to play games. She's another scaredy cat where, yeah. you know, as soon as somebody shows feelings, she's out. Um, right. But I actually found myself surprisingly just giving her the benefit of the doubt a lot. Just being mm -hmm. like, you know, if I was in her situation and it's got to be tough knowing that someone thinks so fucking highly of you. I know. Right? Like, how do you live up to that? Good how Lord. can I live up to what you're telling me you've built me up to in your brain when I don't feel that special in any right. way? I feel like a normal person with problems, just like right. everybody else in the world. Um, I was very sympathetic to her. I was surprisingly sympathetic to her. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if that's just because like, like having like a woman's perspective yeah, on the I, situation. I yeah, I, I really do think that's kind of what it comes down to. <laughs> yeah, that's that's cool, because I, yeah, because I was definitely like once I met her in, in this story, it's like, yeah, she's just she's just another thief, like she's just <laughs> another girl, like she's got yeah. her like her own issues, and I yeah. I thought that at, initially I remember when I read this for the first time, I was initially disappointed and I was kind of mad because I was like well lynch like built this girl up like this whole like crazy way and and she's just like fine yeah and then later after like a couple of rereads i was like oh i think that's the point like i think that's the i think that's the whole point yes. and, and that's yes. why that's why i was telling everybody like don't fucking tell sam anything because i want her <laughs> to have that same experience yeah. Like um, you want an authentic reaction to yeah. how she to me and not like, hey, don't get your hopes up because it's just gonna be like a normal girl. You know, right. What I mean? Yeah. I wanted um, I wanted to avoid like whenever you yeah. were asking questions, I was like, I like there's so much I wanna tell her, but I just want her to have the same <laughs> yeah. experience that I had. Yeah, even with reading <laughs> the back of the book and it's sort of in a way spoiling it for me. Sure. Um, it didn't really spoil it for me. It didn't spoil her personality. Or yet. Yeah. Any of that. And I was just really impressed with her. And I had always thought she was going to end up being someone who was like lacks equal, but because he had essentially taken over the group, she had issues with it. And that's basically what it turned out to be is it was a, I want to be able to like stand on my own. I want people to look to me for advice. I think I'm smart enough to be yeah. the leader. And you've clearly already stepped into that role. And she doesn't want to be dependent on someone, you know, because they've yeah. always kind of been taught to be really independent in a sense. Um, yeah. And I think when Locke took over, she almost kind of felt like on the back burner and that she wasn't important. And I think she had equally as good ideas and as good of a brain as Locke does. Well, that, that kind of leads me into my next note here. I have um, the interesting thing about Sabatha and Locke as a duo is that they're both kind of in the same, like if you're looking at it in like a Dungeons and Dragons way or like an RPG mm -hmm. way, they're both kind of in the same class or the same yeah. skill tree. Like they're mm -hmm. both um, charmers. They're both yeah. like silver tongue users. Whereas <clears throat> Jean, or, oh my God, I did it. You whereas, did it. I'm <laughs> you did it. <laughs> whereas, whereas Jean is a bruiser. And then the other two, Callow and Galdo, are 
um, like jack of all trades, master of nuns. Like they're kind of in their own class. It where was they're nice like, to have them back in this book. Yes, right? Isn't that so great? I only just realized that that I was like, oh, I loved having them again. It really they're sucked. So not good. Them. And I, I love, I love the storyline of it, it. Worked out so fucking perfectly. Where at the beginning of the book, they're like one shaving their head bald, one's growing their hair long. They're like, I'm so tired of being twins. And then at the end, they get like they, they there's this role, the chorus, the, and they're both competing for the role. And somebody says, "Why don't you both just do it? Like, why don't you go back and forth and do the yeah. chorus?" Save the and, one's head. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, "Oh, okay." And so they start doing the chorus, and they grow together again. Like I, I forget yeah. what the actual quote is, but at the end of the book, it mentions that they had like a love for one another again and that they had grown together through like doing this chorus together and it even says when they're doing the actual play it says like they were perfect in rhythm like it like doing doing the lines back and forth they were just in sync and i I was like man i love that story arc so much i think that works so perfectly like i hated that they were fighting but it was also like a very real thing that i think people go through in their lives yeah so it was it was I, I just loved having them back. And I'm really yeah. upset that, like, we most likely won't ever probably get them again, you know? I don't know how... I mean, I, I I think I think that we're going to get the flashbacks of Chains's last year or last yeah. couple of years. And so I, th- I think we'll get them again. Okay. I, I, think, I think that's part of the story that is missing, even though we can surmise... That he probably just died of old age or whatever. I think we're gonna get flashbacks with his like final years. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Good. Well, I would hope so because like they keep alluding to you know when Chains died and then him and Sabatha you know fought because she said we don't have to do it the exact same way. Um, I'd love to like get to that time when right. when he dies and the initial yeah. like what do we do? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Um, but basically, what I was mentioning earlier is that Sabatha and Locke. Uh, they're kind of in the same skill tree. And so it's really interesting to see them. They're both like on par with each other, kind of like they, they each have like their own tricks that are like slightly different than the other persons like Sabatha. Obviously she's like a beautiful woman. And so she can use that to her advantages and Locke um, maybe has like a little bit more of like a silver tongue. Like he's able to talk his way out of things more of anything. (laughs) Yeah. But they're both, like charmers like they're both in that same class and so i Mm -hmm. thought it was interesting where everybody else in the group is so different from each other but sabatha and Locke are like pretty similar which is Um, why i do think they'd be good together because yeah they're both so intelligent in a way that it, it, it you have to have some of that natural talent for it it's not something that you can just study and be great at um right I just really want them to be together. (laughs) I really want them to like, or Sabatha specifically to like figure her shit out, like get it together, you know, like, but now I keep thinking of your theory of like, maybe she didn't run away because of something patients told her. And it's more of like, you know, you got to save Locke. You got to go do this. Um, That would almost make more sense. Yeah. And that's why I think, you know, because I I do think that Sabatha had a bit of a character arc throughout this book where it, you know, we see her in the, not so much in the future timeline, but in the younger timeline where she's like, I'm just looking out for myself. Like, I don't have time for this relationship with this weird kid. Like, I, she's like, I have to, like, look out for myself. <laughs> and now in the future timeline, we we do actively see her take steps to keep Locke safe because <clears throat> the whole reason that she put the boys on the boat was because she thought they were going to fuck everything up for her. And in her head, she's and it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier is she's like both of if anybody fucks this up, both of our lives are on the line. Yeah. So I cannot afford to have you fuck things up. And like I and like I want to keep your life safe. I want to keep my life safe. So I'm just going to put you on this boat so you can't do anything. And so you can see that she's like doing things to save his life um and there's like a couple other things throughout the present day timeline just like in the bottom of that ship in chains if she really didn't want them yeah she put them in luxury like 
everything. They could have been chained to the wall, so they physically could not, you know, yeah. leave. And there were more steps she could have taken, but she had them with, like, the best chef, and they were the only ones on board, and it was going to be right. this simple little, you know, up the coast and back. And right. I think that showed her hand that she does care about them. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so I... And then we see my other piece of little evidence is that at the end or near the end when they're having dinner together and they're like about to do it patience comes in and she's like this is who Locke really is at that moment i was like god i fucking why is why is she involved me? why is she involved is that like, when you texted me and you were like i fucking hate patience and yes. i was like i've still got like 200 pages left i don't know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's when i was like god i hate patience so much i read that but, and i was like oh i think this is what he was talking about i think <laughs> he hated patience yeah but I also was like so sweet before like you know, he was going to make her dinner, and she's like, what are you doing? We do this together. We do you this know? together, you yeah. Know, you don't make me sit, and then she just fucked it all up, and I didn't I understand know. why Patience feels the need to keep pulling them apart. I don't I know. understand what the larger picture motive is, because they I were think, still competing. Yeah, I think I think the motive, and we kind of see it at the very end when she shows Savitha the picture, I think her ultimate motive was revenge for the falconer. Like, I she, think I was surprised by that where she was like, yeah, as patients, I don't care. But as his mother, yeah. Right. Fuck you. Right. Yep. Exactly. But it's like your son but, sucks. Like, why? Yeah. Your son sucks, here? though. Your son sucks. <laughs> and even she, she knows he sucks. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I actually thought it was really crazy that, you know, the falconer, the whole thing is like, if you try to save yourself from pain too quickly, you trap yourself in your own mind. That was really fascinating. Yeah. Um, to me and then the flashbacks of what led up to him getting there and how they were on like opposing factions um yeah. i thought that was really interesting too but i i came away from it being like your son sucks like why yeah. why? why are you defending him in any way <laughs> yeah. and then look what he does to you in the end right <laughs> yeah for real so so much for that <laughs> right exactly exactly um but yeah, I think, you know, I, I think there's multiple mo moments where we can see that Sabatha cares for Locke. Like, even we do get one point of view thing of her when she's reading the letter and she's, yeah. it like melts her heart. And you can see the, you can actually see the effect that Locke has on her. She's like, God damn it. He did exactly what my heart wanted him to do. Like, ah. Uh. And so you, like, and after after Patience comes in and tells her, like, this is who Locke is or whatever, you know, we see Jean go to her later and he's like, are you going to believe this bitch? Like, really? And she's like, I don't know. And then, But we see her come back at the very end. We see her come back with Locke and be like, it's okay. Let's just get the fuck out of here. Like, let's just go. Let's just get out of here. And so you can tell that she's grown and that she isn't phased forever by like these things that are said and so with all of that evidence i'm thinking there's no way that she just like saw this picture and took it at face value and just ran i'm like i i think there's there has to be something else mm -hmm. there it has to it has to look a certain way to lock and to the reader but there's something that we didn't see and i think I think that's going to be crucial. That'll explain why Sabbath left. I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe but, it's a little the bit other of both. Thing is, is he confuses you because she's a runner, and I. This was another mm -hmm. thing that I ended up sympathizing with her is because I was getting frustrated. I'm like, hear him out. Let me explain. Like, stop right. him off and just believe. Just wait like, five oh. minutes. <laughs> and then I thought about, mm, well, Sam. You hate conflict a lot, and mm. when it starts, you usually <laughs> just need some time to, like, get it straight in your own head, and then you're willing to come back when you've calmed down and be like, okay, let's calmly talk this through. So it was a very uh, telling moment for myself mm. where I'm like, you're right. Yeah, I'm like, maybe you're like, you wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> like, you've done this. You hate conflict, and you will just run away, but... For me to have the best possible conversation with someone, I need that time to sort through everything in my own head and then come back with like clearer thoughts. So then right. I was like, okay, I actually do kind of understand, you know, why she reacts the way she does. Right. <laughs> for sure. For sure. 
Okay, so before we wrap up for the day, there's a couple things I want to talk about. I have one more thing that I want to say about Sabatha and Locke, and then I want to talk about the Mon Crane company, the acting oh, yeah. company. Yeah. And then I have some quotes that I have to read. I think I even have a bookmark um, of uh, like the audio that I want to share. Okay. So, um, so let's. I just have one last note on Sabatha and Locke, no and then we can talk about the no Mon rush. Crane company. <laughs> Um, so I really, I, and this is something that I didn't think about until this read through, like I didn't catch this at all before, but I think it was done intentionally. And I, I really like the fact that we have one timeline where Locke and Sabatha are working together, which is the, the acting, like the whole, the acting con or mm -hmm. like the whole Mon Crane storyline. They are on the same team they are working together to achieve a shared goal and in the present timeline we get a we get a story where they're working against each other and so we get to see both sides of the conflict and resolution with them where you know in one they're like not butting heads but they're they're their talents are being pushed against each other and it's more of a versus thing and then in the previous timeline, we're seeing their talents shared. And I, I just thought that was a really cool idea because I got to the end of this book and I'm like, I, I literally just thought about this today. I was like, man, it would be so cool instead of getting a storyline of them like against each other, it'd be so cool to see one where they're like on the same team doing a con. And I was like, wait a minute, that's what we got in the previous yeah. timeline. <laughs> And so I just thought, I thought that was super cool. And I thought that was a great way to showcase uh, how these characters interact in different situations. I thought it was interesting in the sense that in the flashbacks, it's almost like they were in a way being prepared for when Chains wasn't going to be around anymore. You guys yeah. are fighting with each other nonstop. Yes, that's such a good point. You, you can't get it together. You need to go see what it's going to be like, essentially, when I'm not here, that you guys can only count on each other. You only have each other and you should be able to trust each other enough at this point and be family and, yeah. and all be able to work towards the same goal together. And so that's what I thought the main yep. thing was. And that's why it kind of made me sad about Sabatha, because I'm like, see, you guys could have done this together. Yes. You yeah. could have. You guys could have been amazing together. And would Kahlo and Galdo still be alive today? You know, right. you just gotten your shit together and been able to work as a team. Yeah, yeah. Which for what you were clearly capable of. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's so interesting because I think this is something that I may have just realized on this read too, is that when there, there there's a line uh, in the narrative, not in like a dialogue thing, but in the narrative, <clears throat> it mentions that, you know, when Locke and Sabatha first meet Bulidarzi, Bulidazi, whatever yeah. his name is, and um, they're like talking to him and they're like playing their parts and Bulidazi yeah. is falling for it. Locke, there's a moment where Locke is like, holy shit, this is working. Like, oh my God, he's actually believing us. Like, this is crazy. And it made me realize, I think this is the first time they've ever pulled a con on the nobility. This is the first time that they've, they've actually put their skills that Chains has taught them into a con that would later become the, you know, Oster Shallon Brandy con. Like, you know, it's, <laughs> this is the first time they're doing something like that. And it was and, so smart how they picked real people to play in yeah. the their story with. I thought that was so smart because they immediately get checked on it. And, right. you know, it checks out. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was brilliant. And I believe that was Sabatha's kind of initial idea that they yeah. then ran off of. Yeah, I liked I liked them planning that because one of them will come up with this like foundational idea and then they'll both like, oh, and what about this? 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 And it, they just create like this epic con. Good team. Good and team. And I'm like, God, this team is so good. Like, I love it so much. Like, I love, I think the, the what I love most about this team, especially in the flash, flashbacks, is where, and I, and obviously this is what Chains is going for, is where one character is deficient, 
there's another character that can come in and fill that void with their hole and whatever they're deficient in the next person comes in and like does the same yeah it's just so it's so good and now that it's locker so similar but one's a guy and one's a girl and there are only certain things women can use tools and right. that like, men can use. So I, they're, again, I think they're like two sides of the same coin. Yeah, for for example, like when, when Bully Dazi, uh, you know, they, they meet him and we don't know this necessarily yet, but he has like this interest in Sabatha. And then he asks her to leave the room and he, he asks to talk to Lukaza, uh, Locke. And if Locke hadn't been there, like as the male... Um, chaper not chaperone, but like the, the, the yeah, the main heir. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If if he hadn't been there, he wouldn't have been able to talk to Bully Dazi and been like, oh yeah, our family would definitely be down for that. Yeah, totally. Because I'll talk to her. <laughs> yeah, because Sabatha, if he had had that same conversation with Sabatha, she wouldn't have been able to make that decision. It's the male that makes that decision or mm-hmm. like sends the request up the line to his yeah. father and grandfather. <laughs> And so it's like, man, it just, it's all so seamless. And I would love, I cannot wait until we get more flashbacks with them past this point where we can see Locke and Sabatha and Jean and Callo and Galdo all putting a con together and running like an Ostershall and Brandy con yeah. on somebody. Like, oh, it'd be so good. It'd be well, so can, good. Can we talk about how in the end that was something I didn't see coming where they, Baldazi gets killed by uh yes. her name Lenora uh Lenora Genora. Gen- Genora. and I didn't see that coming and I thought that was like a really great twist at the end and how they had to cover this up and then they pretended you know um they had the the leader guy Montecrane like throw yeah. his voice and pretend to be him yes and, but then when he like double crosses them in the end and runs oh away with the money that I actually didn't see coming but i love how they used that to then pin yes yeah we'll, out p- we'll just pin the whole thing on him oh it was so great it was i so I, great. I hope we get an easter egg in a future book where we just find out like what happened to him like oh we yeah. got word of this guy that died or whatever we, like because i was like there i it, it actually worked for them i felt like more in the end that he tried to run off or he ran off with the money because nobody's going to believe him if they catch him where he's yeah. like, no, like they did it and we, blah, blah, blah. no, because you ran away with the money. Like, right. It, it's like you. So, yeah. I, I it was brilliant. And, Ooh. and the lady, I forget what her name was, but the lady they're talking to at the end there, that's part of the nobility that like knows their family or whatever. Um, like, you would have never been allowed to choose. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And and she she gave them the money that he ran off with. So at the end of the day, it's like a win-win for everybody. <laughs> yeah, it was great. I, yeah. I really loved how that was like neatly tied up and packaged. And that they were like, and you guys need to leave now. Like you need right. to leave. Right, and you, and you need I'm to like, go. Say less. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what did you think of the uh, the rest of the acting company? Like some of the characters, like Sylvanas or Mon Crane himself, or... Uh, the there. only issue I had during those flashbacks was keeping straight who was who. So oh, I had to, okay. because everyone had to keep using their fake names. So I kept getting a little confused. I should have written it down, like what everyone's name they That's were what going I did, yeah. was. Um, I liked the rest of the troop. I had gotten a little confused at first because when Jean sleeps with Janora, I was like, wait, why is he saying it's his first time? Because I was getting confused from book two. Ezra, you know? yeah. And then I was like, no, it's a flashback, Sam. So this would be like his first time. And right. um, I I really liked it, but I it, I almost feel like we didn't get enough of them. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. you brought in all these players and I understood why they were brought in. And you gave me like a little taste in the beginning of the husband and wife who came in and she was yeah. fighting with Tabitha over the part and Jean in the one husband fight. And then they like yeah. split a cigarette after. That was so good. I loved that. Um, and then they were just kind of not really there any anymore other than right. just being randomly mentioned. Um, right. I, I would have liked a little a little more of their stories, yeah. but again, I don't know what it would have really done to the overall plot anyway, so yeah. it wasn't like a strike against the book for me. Right. Um, I right, think right. They, I think he could have written a whole book based off of 
their time there. You know, I know, <laughs> I know. I would have loved to just like yeah. see so much more of that. And I, yeah. I think I, I really liked the Locke and Genora uh, storyline. I think a lot of people have criticized the book for it being um, kind of an icky romance where she's like oh, a lot Jean. older. Jean. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because you know she's like, oh, did I say Locke? Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, John and I was like, Genora. What did I miss? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did they have an affair? Um, but uh, but yeah, I I think that a lot of people criticize that for it being like this age gap romance thing going on. But I'm like, I I don't know. Like I I guess I just don't really hold like fantasy books to like that high of a standard when it comes to that. I don't know. It's just funny because I feel like it's a very current um, conversation going on. Yeah, and where... it wouldn't have been back then. We're okay with there being an age gap if the man is the older one, but if the woman is the older one, suddenly we're like, ew, gross. Like, this is like extra gross. And I mean, at the end of the day, if you're both consenting adults and one's not tricking the other, you know, well, John, I mean, by, by today's standard, John was not an adult. How old were they then? Like, like 16, 17. Yeah. I mean, but still, so it's... Gallo and Callum and Galdo were already like you know visiting the Lily thing. I know, right? And so I mean, if you're both consenting, yeah, uh, it didn't bother me. It, yeah, it, it, it didn't, really bother didn't bother me. Bother me, and I could see why maybe it would for other people. But at the sure. end of the day, like, what is it? It's a really story. Matter? Yeah, it's a yeah. story. They're characters. Like I don't yeah. really care. You know, and they're in this like intense situation. What about yeah. when they drink uh, the spit bucket and like vomit? Oh. Every yeah I, what what's yeah. the what's the quote i have it's uh what uh what in the cock blistering hell is an ash bastard <laughs> i was so confused and then when they explained what it was i was like oh i didn't oh, need to know that i was so like gross. I, literally gagging as i was reading i was like mm, mm. oh <laughs> Ugh, it was so so bad <laughs> It is so so gross. I so gross. yeah. That's funny that that's like a tradition for them to like what why like why why I don't oh god. I watch the show. It's a very stupid reality TV show. Um, but it's one of my guilty pleasures where like I can just zone out, you know, and yeah. I feel better about my life. And they went to a vineyard and. You're supposed to like, you know, taste it and spit it in the spit bucket. In the end, they did a contest, and whoever lost had to drink it, and they did it. And I oh during that scene as well. So, it, it's apparently not something that's out of the realm of contest. Oh my god, that's so fucking disgusting. <laughs> so disgusting. Uh, I just I can't think about it too much because I will start gagging. <laughs> yeah, I I loved I loved like when that whole thing started. Um, have you ever you've seen Step Brothers, right? Remember, remember when they're making the bunk bed and one brother like runs up, he's like, something terrible happened. You got to come see it. There's blood everywhere. Oh and they, they go down there and like the bed is just like kind of on top of the yeah. other brother. That's, that's what this felt like. We're like, yeah. someone ran up to like, somebody drank the ash bastard. Yeah. You got to come down here. And he's like, what in the cock blistering hell is the ash bastard? Yeah. And then you find out that like, they are the way they are because they'd been told nobody could chug it and so they right. decided to chug it and i was like oh, oh. my god oh like, all right we need to move away from this scene we need like, to go I, I, we need to I, go I need to stop, <laughs> please like i don't want to hear any more about this it was almost worse than finding out what they did to redheads in the sense of like being able to digest yeah. it, where i was just like Ugh, was stop. it <laughs> was it was it worse than the hair that hermione drank <laughs> You know I have a thing about hair. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know sorry. I have a thing about hair. I can't even think about it because I will, I will spew everywhere. I okay, okay, okay. I would have never been able to drink polyjuice potion at all. Period. Yeah, definitely. Period. Definitely. Not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a hair thing. I could if I had to choose between polyjuice potion and the spit bucket, I would pick the spit bucket. Oh. Every every time damn that is wild yeah like, okay that, if i had to i could not handle hair in my drink mm. for sure mm -hmm. what what did you what did you think about jasmine moncrane just as a character he was very <laughs> just as a person 
he, he felt to me like a thespian, you know, yeah. like he only cares about themselves, like only living kind of in the moment, not really yeah. responsible. And they got him out of the prison and he didn't even seem grateful for it. Yeah. And, you know, then when the, the guy is killed, he at first wants to, he like blames Janora and I'm like, motherfucker, don't even right. go there. Like, fuck yeah. you. He does, he does <laughs> walk that back pretty quickly. He does, yeah. but he had to be like, have yeah. someone else say something to walk it back. And I'm like, all right, well, you walked it back. Okay, whatever. But from that moment, well, even before when they were going to pay off all of his debts and he's like, no, I want to pay him off. Give me the money. I was like, oh, this is the guy to watch. I was like, right. he, he's a snake. Like, do not trust him in any way. And I had forgotten by the time we got to the end of the book, how much of a snake he was. Um, right. so it did catch me a little by surprise when he ran off with the money. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Why? What do, how do you feel about him? Honestly, for me, and this is gonna, this is even surprising for me to say, but I think for specifically this read through, Jasmine Moncrane might have been like the standout character for me. Not because <laughs> like, I, I'm not like, oh, his character was written so well or anything. I just think he was so fucking funny. Yeah. Like there was so <laughs> many moments where I was just laughing my ass off i think there were certain points where i thought his like string of curses and stuff that he would put together were like better than the gentleman bastard he was a gentleman like... bastard in that <laughs> like, Dude. no he was kamori <laughs> they were so or, or he was so fucking funny i i, I loved it, it was I... Funny, like reading on through the books realizing that like the kamori are known as like just these like savages in a way like they yeah. don't take any shit they are gonna yeah. you're telling them you're gonna kill them and they're still gonna spit on you right before you do it and it yeah. came out much more in the later books and that was actually a really enjoyable um part of the book for me <laughs> yeah for sure for sure i love I, just the way that they shit on each other you know like they have a definitely. way with bad words <laughs> I love I, I got some quotes with uh with Jasmer Moncrane. One of them is uh Jasmer's on the front of the on the stage and they're trying to figure out who's gonna play Amadine. This is like right before Sabatha gets the role. And Silvana says, You should play Amadine, Jasmer. Think of all the pretty skirts Janora could sew for you. And then uh or maybe they had just figured out that Sabatha was gonna be it because Jasmer says uh, Verena's our Amadine. There is a certain deficiency of breasts in our company, and while yours might be larger than hers, Sylvanas, I doubt as many people would pay to see them. <laughs> I thought it was interesting, too, that Sabatha knew, like, when they were telling him they were going to get him out, that she had to say, like, no, and you're going to give me this role. Like, this yeah. role I'm getting. Like, she set herself up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah, that was great. That, that was great. I loved, uh, <laughs> wait let me let me just see what the let me see what the audible thing i have is because i don't oh, want to yeah. repeat the same the same quote so here mm -hmm. i'll share i'll share this real quick okay let's see what this is i totally forget aim of the noble you struck said sabatha why do you care said Montcrane. how can it possibly be of aid to you as you scurry back where you fucking came from <laughs> keep your voice down said one of the guards oh you'll have to be Oh, this is when Jasmer is in prison and they're trying yeah. to get him out. And he's like, fuck yeah. off. Carried into court tomorrow. <laughs> you know, that might be pleasant, said Moncrane. Can we give that a try? <laughs> Jasmer, said Sabatha sharply. Look at me, you stupid ass. Jasmer <laughs> did indeed look at her. I don't care what you think of us, she whispered. You know what kind of person our master is, what kind of organization we come from. And if you don't stop braying like a jackass, this is what's going to happen. We'll leave. I love this plan, <laughs> said Moncrane. Take this plan all, all the way. The way. <laughs> You'll spend your year and a day inside this tower. Then they'll cut your god's damned hand off and throw you out the door. And do you know who'll be standing there? More Kamori than you've ever seen in your fucking life. Not just us, or the other three currently toiling on your behalf on the other side of this pimple of a city. I mean big, unreasonable, cross-eyed motherfuckers straight out of the wounds of hell. And they'll take you for a ride, locked in a box ten days all the way to Kamor, sloshing in your own piss. Now wait a minute. Said Mon Crane. <laughs> you don't have any other fucking. I think that's it. I but love that I... though because I thought that was really smart to be like, 
oh, you don't want to listen to us? You're going to stay here for a year and a day and you're willing to lose your hand with the creditors? And, and yeah. Shit. She was like, no, motherfucker. Yeah. Like, we will be the first ones to be here waiting for you. Right. When you we will fuck up your life. You know who our freaking, you know. Yeah, exactly. You know where we come from. Yeah. <laughs> I just He's love. Here to be, like, taken care of by you. And we're already having to take care of you. Yeah, exactly. I just <laughs> the part that made me laugh so hard was uh, she's like, "Fine, we'll go back to Kamor." And he, I can just like picture it so clearly in my head. He's like, "I love this plan. Take this plan all the way." Like uh, it seems like, like oh, a Robin really? Williams bit or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have another great Mon Crane quote. Jasmer, you lucky bastard. I didn't believe them when they said you were off the hook. How many cocks did you have to lick to get them to slip the chains? <laughs> Mas <laughs> Master, Calabar Master Calabazi said Moncrane, you know a gentleman never does his own dirty work. I simply made a lot of promises concerning your daughters. Or was it your sons? Gods know I can never tell them apart. <laughs> So great. I love it's the so like funny. witty clips that they have in this these books. Great. It's so Ooh. funny. Do I have do I have another Mon Crane bit? I thought I had Oh no, that one's Sean. I can I can read these two real quick. These are funny. Yeah. Um <clears throat> this is where so Locke did the thing with the guy's nuts where he like grabbed his nuts. Oh, I and, love like, that. You're gonna take me to her. You're gonna yeah. lose. <laughs> and what I thought was funny is this also happened in Night Angel Nemesis, and I'm like, it's like almost the exact same thing. And so I'm like, I wonder if Brent Weeks got it from this. Um, but Locke had done that previously, and then Jean is delivering the final letter to Sabatha, the one that she reads and gets all like emotional over. And so he's at the door. <laughs> he's at the door, and he's looking at the guy that got his balls grabbed. Yeah. And that guy says, you're a crude bastard, Callus. And then John says, and you're still favoring lamentably tight breaches, Jean Fain de Yon. I'll take the same two hostages my colleague did. I invite you to ponder the differences in our sizes and proportional strength of grip. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And then... uh Oh, this isn't this isn't so much a funny quote, but I thought it was a good one. Um, not for like any particular like story reason. I was just like, wow, that's like a cool bit of writing. Yeah. Uh, not for the this is, Jean is seeing Sabatha. Like this is the first time they've been one on one together in the same mm -hmm. room. <clears throat> not for the first time, Jean felt a strange sense of displacement as his memories of Sabatha tangled with the woman before his eyes. It was like looking at a reverse ghost, a reality somehow less tangible than the, rec than the recollections five years gone. He'd lived those five years so gradually, but to his eyes, she'd received them all at once. And in studying the new, sorry, and in studying the new lines time had sketched for her he felt the faint tug of his own passing years like a weight in his heart how much older did he look to her Aww. and i i love like this really melancholy moment where like sure like he's he's glad to see sabatha and everything but it's it's this thing where like you don't see someone for five years and you're just like god they look older do i look older like just just that oh man yeah. it just it just felt like so honest and like Lynch didn't really need to include that, but it was just yeah. such a cool little bit of like mm -hmm. just realistic like character building. I thought yeah. it was really cool. I it's true that. though. It's like, yeah. yeah, you're you're seeing them through eyes, you know, in a yeah. different way. And it's like the third scene me the you know, differently right. as well. Yeah, for sure. I think Jean is my favorite. Jean is so good. I love I him. I think he's my favorite. He's like, always the most even keeled. Yeah. Yeah. He loves to read, you know, he's very, when he got into the whole, like, I want to do the props and the sewing and stuff, or like, I can do it. I was like, yeah, that's what I would want to do. I don't right. want to be in the back, just right. like sewing shit and getting all the props and the stage ready. I would not want to be on stage whatsoever. Right, right, right. <laughs> I just love him. And sometimes I worry that Locke takes him for granted because yeah, Locke always see goes into these like despairing holes yeah. and he always pulls him out and it's very rarely the other way around, you right. know? It can be like a semi-unbalanced friendship, which well, could I lead think... to 
problems. Yeah. Well, I think I think that's kind of a recurring thing in these books because, like, for the for, for the past couple books, including this one, we've seen Locke in some sort of state of distress at the beginning of the book and Jean taking care of him. And I don't know if you noticed, but at the end of this book, when Sabatha runs away, Locke is like, "Oh my God," and Jean is like. So I can imagine you're going to be at the bottom of a bottle for the next few weeks. And it's like, I wonder if in at the beginning of the next book, we'll see Locke in a state of like, oh my God, like pity is me. Like I can't do it again. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think it's just like a recurring thing with them. But I would, I, I think we deserve to see Locke taking care of Jean. I think you're yes. right because... Because we've we've been told that they have this amazing relationship, and and we've seen it. Like we've seen Locke, like Locke is willing to give up his own life for his friend. Like we we know that he cares for him. There's nothing that convinces so us. Antidote, you know, knowing yeah. he would die. Yeah. So like we know that, but it would be cool to see Jean in a state of despair of some kind, and and Locke being the one to like take up the charge and to be like let's get back in gear and let's you know really get our heads in the game and yeah, John wasn't really given time to mourn um at, I know Ez Ezri was it I can't remember Ezri. yeah that Ezri. was such a missed opportunity in this yeah book. where you know I thought that's what the whole point was is you know now Locke gets to be there for John for once when he's like the one who's caught in this you know depression um and we didn't get that <laughs> right for sure yeah that was kind of a a misstep it's like you would expect like Jean wasn't really I don't know even if he didn't like have like a total breakdown or whatever we just didn't really see any sort of um you know yeah. despair on this mm -hmm. at all um random funny quote I'm just scrolling past some of these and reading them uh when they're on the boat one of the guys says we've been set up with a cook so good I'd fuck him six days a week just to keep him on deck <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. And then John says to Locke later, uh, the poison orchid is as likely to come save us as I am to give to a live albatross. <laughs> it's just such a random <laughs> fish to <laughs> Oh, my God. Um, but, yeah, there there was a quote. There was a quote from, um, from John that was like, so Locke says, the gods must hate you, having made you my nurse. And then Jean says, hells, I was made your nurse when we were 10 years old. And I'm just like, oh, <laughs> just the little guys. Like, <laughs> oh, my God. Um, what do you, yeah, what did you think about the whole beginning? We could talk about that real quick. The, uh, just like the beginning where, where Locke is sick. And Jean is going and getting these, uh, like these physicers and bringing them yeah. in. Did you did you like this bit or? I mean, I I it made sense for the story and where they ended up, where they did. Um, I don't like Locke when he's in this like depressive, which like this time I understood because like you were dying, like right. okay, it's just but, like, miserable. You you set this up this way. Like, you decided to give Jean the antidote without telling him, and so you knew this is what was going to be coming, so stop being such a fucking asshole to him when he's, like, trying to, like, find any way to save you, you know? Yeah. It, it, But it made sense for the plot line, because they needed to be desperate to be able to accept the offer patients gave them. Yeah, during... we. That that whole thing was crazy where she's like healing him on the ship. Yeah. Like, it was a where... little confusing, but I got yeah. like the end the the meaning of what it was supposed to do. Yeah, they do like this whole ritual and, and in the middle of it Locke sees Bug like dead and yeah. with like black eyes and stuff. And, and I didn't understand why Jean like passed out during it. Like I didn't understand that. I, I, like, think, I think it was just the energy in the room, just like okay. the just like crazy yeah. amounts of because he said he could like he could feel it behind his eyes like it was permeating everything yeah. but at first i was like are they transferring into him like what's going on here yeah that was interesting they had like a little momet and they had to convince the momet that it was Locke and that he would take the poison 
I'm like, man, that's really cool because it reminds me a lot of King Killer, where they had to find sympathy. Like she even says, like we have, we have candlesticks and candles from Kamor, and they were stolen to provide a better link with you and who you are. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. I didn't think yeah. of that. That is very King Killer. Yeah, and I'm glad that we got to see so much of the magic in this book and kind of see not like the nuts and bolts of how it works, but we have like a better understanding. Yeah. And and you were saying in the first episode and I think even the last episode that you're like I you're like are we going to get more of the Bonds mage? And I'm like, "Yes, we definitely will." Do do you feel like you got enough of them in this book? Yeah, I, yeah, I would say yeah. Like I got enough that it answered a decent amount of the questions that I had. Um I mean, I think I could read a whole book that was like the Bond's sure. Mage. Like yeah, I yeah. think I could absolutely read that, but I think we got enough in this one yeah. that it answered my questions, but the way that it ended where they're like we have said we were going to go in hiding because we felt like we were getting too close to the and one elephant. side killed the other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um yeah, I I appreciate appreciated the amount that was put in there. I don't think I needed more. Would I have liked more? Sure, but sure. I don't think it was necessary to the storyline. Right. I think we got what we needed. Yeah, that's that's definitely fair. I, I liked I liked what we got. I liked learning about um like how none of them have real names mm -hmm. and for the Falconer to have his mom make a name for him at birth, like really fucks him over. That and, was interesting. That yeah. was really interesting. <laughs> and I, I think it's setting it up because at the end we see the Falconer have so much power. And I think that what's going to happen is because he has a real name, Locke is somehow going to find out that name. Yeah. And when he gets his Bonds Mage abilities, he'll be able to use that name against the Falconer. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, really that's the only way he kills him, I would think. It's got to be, because, I yeah. mean, unless he gets powers, you are S-O-L, or shit out of luck. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, like, Patience is, like, explaining all this to Locke. And yeah, he... but now that she's, like, dead, yeah. he would be able to get the answers that he needed. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I like... Now he's going to be torn at all times, like, what that she told me is true and what isn't. Right, right, yeah, because now we don't even have the uh, the other mages who died, we don't even have them to confirm anything. Well, it was um, interesting that they said in Tal Varar, they had pulled Jean aside without either of them knowing, and yeah. sorted through all of his memories, and I was like, oh. Whoa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. Yeah, that was really crazy. Yeah. Um, but I liked, I liked how, uh, do you, do you know what the idiot rule is in writing? It's, no. it's where you have one character who is, uh, not as informed as another character. And it's a way for the writer to give you an info dump without just info dumping on the page, like without mm -hmm. just being like, and this is what the bonds mage are. Well, like, they have to explain it to the idiot. Right, so they have to explain it to the idiot, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, I like that, I, I really like that way of writing. It really, um, like I'm, I'm one of those people that's like, tell, don't show. Like, I don't want you to tell me, I want you to show me. Yeah. And I think it's a perfect way of getting around that in most cases. Mm -hmm. And so I liked that uh, Locke put this thing in place where he's like, I'll do this for you, but you have to tell me anything I want. Yeah. And so he asks her all these questions. Um, and then there's a funny quote where he's like, uh, he's like, so what do you do with ungifted children when you have them? Like thinking like, oh, do they kill off their ungifted yeah. children or whatever? Yeah. And she looks at him and he goes, she goes, uh, cherish them and raise them, you imbecile. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, oh, okay. <laughs> that reminded me a lot of like in Harry Potter with, that was something I did not realize until I read the books versus having watched the movies with, um, what's the guy who in the Hogwarts castle, he's like the weirdo with the cat. Oh, uh, not Peeves, but uh, Filch. 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 I yeah. never realized that he was someone who was born to magical parents and didn't have parents. And once yeah. I read the books, I was like, oh, this makes sense. And now that I've rewatched the movies, I've caught how they say it in there, but it had never oh, okay. served for me before at all. Right. Um, so it's funny, you know, like, 
It's like, yeah, we don't fucking kill them just because they don't have magic. You know right. what I mean? Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> don't let them live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, real quick. So I'm just, I'm just running through some quotes real quick. So Locke explains to Sabatha, they're like having their dinner and he's like, yeah, he's like, don't you remember Chains's uh, universal theological principle? Life boils down to standing in line to get shit dropped on your head. Everybody's got a place in the queue. You can't get out of it. And just when you start to congratulate yourself on surviving your dose of shit, you realize that the line is actually circular. <laughs> I thought that was a really interesting quote. I that was, was so true. Like, oh, okay, oh. yeah. That's just life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I thought that was Applied so good. To my own, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I loved when uh, when Jean and Janora are. They've just had sex and they're like laying in bed naked, and they're like just about to do it again. And Locke runs into the room, and like maybe it's just the way the audiobook said it, but it was just so fucking funny. Locke, like, oh. Locke, Locke runs into the room, room, and he's like. Giovanno, it's the Asino brothers. You wouldn't believe what they. Oh my God's holy shit! <laughs> I just love the real. abruptness. <laughs> yeah, it was very real. Like it felt. <laughs> oh my God's holy shit! <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, we great. we talked about the. Uh, oh, so well, I guess we should talk about this first. Locke and Sabatha have their first tumble in the sheets, um, and that was. I don't know. I. Like, I don't know. I thought it was really, really interesting because Lynch didn't do the thing where he's like, and they had sex for the first time and it was, it was magical. Amazing. Yeah. It was like, no, there was like some awkward fumbling. And at the end of it, neither of them were like really satisfied. Yeah. And Locke at the end of it was like, I'm sorry if I hurt you or like if it didn't feel good for you. And she's like, we have plenty of times to try again later. Like, try we this, can. Yeah. Like we can, we can do it again. At I thought some it was other... very like sweet and like real. You yeah, know what I mean? It, it, I it reading felt... this where the first time they have sex, it's oh my god, it's amazing, especially as a woman. Like no, yeah, that's like it's not how it works. Okay, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's not. It's not going to be like the best. No. Um, and... But I like how she said like, but we have all the time to like you know figure, figure it, it out. out. Yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> and. Uh... Yeah, I mean, sweet. you know, not to get too personal or anything, but I remember my first time was not, like, <laughs> mind-blowing. <laughs> Mine, oh, it was so bad. It was just so bad. <laughs> yeah, I, so I like, <laughs> you know, obviously I, I wasn't, like, probably miserable in the way that, you know, some, <laughs> some girls are their first time, but it was, like... <laughs> I, I felt very much like Locke where I got to the end of it and I was like, this is something that I've been like dreaming about for years. And at the end of it, I was like, that was okay. Like that, that was, was fine. Yeah. <laughs> My first time was a very, just like, all right, I'm glad I like, I've gotten this done with for the yeah, first time. Same, yeah. <laughs> like, all right, I just wanted to do this. Yeah. We did it. it wasn't great, but done the first time i don't have to think about that anymore you know right. and yeah you only go up from here <laughs> yeah i loved i loved at the end of the book when they had it was in the flashbacks but they had gone through like the whole play and everything and it's kind of like the last night with the mon crane company mm -hmm. and they like they tried again and, and the quote is uh they were they were still shy awkward and unschooled but if their first night together had been confusing and, and incomplete their second well, their second taught them why people keep trying. Yeah. And I'm that like, was, that's a good, that's a yeah, good note yeah. to, to leave it on. It I like that. Real. It was very real. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I loved how, so after their first time, you know, we talked uh, earlier about how this whole time with them on Crane Company, they were learning to trust each other and, you know, you specifically mentioned the uh, the twins and how mm -hmm. like they like you ha like they had to learn how to trust each other again. But like people also had to learn how to trust them, even though they're kind of these like screwballs or whatever. Um, and there's this quote. I don't I don't know if anybody else will get as much out of this as I will. Maybe I'm reaching. But the the quote is. Uh, you know, Caldo runs up to their secret door and like opens it by like an inch. He's like, we got to go. And they're like, get out of here. 
And he's like, no, we have to go. And he says, if you trust me, get your clothes on this instant. And they do. And I think it was, it's like a very small thing, but I think it's like this moment where like, no, okay, like if we're going to survive this, we have to trust that Callow, as harebrained as he is, like he wouldn't open, just come up and open the door and, and interrupt yeah. us if it wasn't something serious. And he's and, someone who like clearly loves, you know, laying with the ladies. Right, and, yeah. And they had set this up for them to be together. So for him to come in and interrupt it, like, you know, something like they need your brains, both of right. your brains. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so jump into the very end. We're going to wrap this up. What did you think of the final like ballot tally at the end there? Did you, did you get a lot of what was going on here where like the nine flames and all that? I did. And I thought it was really interesting that the one guy who they had initially approached and said, like, you got to change it at the end. Um, yeah. They actually gave him the offer that he would be interested. Like he kept saying, like, you can offer me all this fucking money. That's not the only thing that I want. And they found a way to be like, no, you're going to be an independent. And then right. everybody is going to want to come to you for the tie breaking vote. And I was like, that was so great. genius. Really? And it made it so it was like a tie. Yeah. In the, the, the race, you know, and, and I was like, that was brilliant. And Sabatha was like, Sabatha was like, it, she asked him, uh, or Locke told her, he's like, yeah, and we gave him 25,000 ducats or whatever. And she's like, how is he possibly going to launder that? Like, th that's too much money. And he's like, well, actually, do you remember the ship that you apprehended? Um, yeah, all of the money that was in there, all of those jewels and everything, you took that back to him. So now he, like, has it and doesn't have to launder it. Like, you just brought that to him. Yeah. So I love that setup because Locke and her were sitting there and she's thinking she's gotten one over on him mm -hmm. <laughs> like, because they had she had turned Nikoros or um, I think that was his name. And it was just so great because I'm sitting there going, bitch, no, yep. he's got you. Like, he's he got you, you yeah. to do that. And I, I love <gasps> oh, I, that was a great moment. I <laughs> love the way that Scott Lynch wrote this too, because I think if you had had either one of them win, you would have split the fan base where half of the fan base would have been like, oh, of course Locke won. And then the other half would be like, oh, of course, like you had to have the the lady win. Like you, you don't want to like not have her win, right? But the way he did it is like, Sabatha like technically won, but Locke did Locke succeeded at what he is so good at, which is being extremely clever and like finding yeah. a way around the He's inevitable. Like, oh, I can't win. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I are gonna win. right. Yeah. It, it was. <laughs> I just... did not see it coming. I I thought when the guy came up and talked, I was like, oh, Locke convinced him to like. Right. Split. Yeah. Movies. Yep. And then when he said what he said, I was like, oh my god, that makes such a better storyline yeah this way i was like and, so and neither good. of them have to lose yep 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 but in my opinion Locke really won because you yeah know what I mean? he like was he able to like figure that out and yeah. switch that vote in a and way I, I think i think it displays so precisely what Locke is good at like he's not like yes he's a silver tongue and yes he's a good thief but more than anything he is good at thinking of the things that other people aren't thinking about like he's good at paying attention to the details that other people aren't picking up on yeah. and i'm like that's such a good display of how how he works i guess yeah he's like oh i don't think i can win but i know how to make it so neither of us really win you know right. what i mean like it was just that blew my mind i was i did not see that coming <laughs> exactly exactly mm -hmm. But it, it made me be okay with, like, the end result, you know? Yeah. I don't know who I would have been okay with winning because I wanted them both to be okay. <laughs> right, 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 right. I, I think also with, with this ending, as we're kind of talking about, like, the very, very end now, um, you know, I think Locke has had a bit of a character arc in this book, but it's not necessarily spanning the length of time they spent in Carthane. It's more like... A, a huge character arc from when they were children to now because you know we talked about earlier how Sabatha was like no I want you to think about this and come back to me and tell me what you've thought about and he came back saying hey like I don't know if I screwed this up or like how else we could have done this but like I'm sorry and like I didn't mean 
for you to feel that way and I will do anything that makes you not feel that way. And that was kind of a turning point for him. And then we see the letter that she gets later. Um, and this, this ties into her running at the end where in this letter, he's like, Hey, like there's a lot of confusing stuff that's going on right now. I'm not going to hold it against you if you need some time. And if you just need to like figure this out, he's like, I'm here. I'm the same me I've always been, but I'm not going to convince you of that. Like, I'm not going to sit here and like try to silver tongue my way into like convincing you to come back. So just know that I'm here for you and I will be at your call. And I think he played it right. I think he played it the way Sabbath needed to hear it. The way Sabbath, yeah, for sure. And then we get like the very end where she runs away and it specifically mentions uh, when Jean's like, do you want to go after her? And he's like, no, I promise to trust her. And that's, that's the clue that tells me, I think there's something more because Locke is like, yeah. he's like, no, like, He's like, I think I just need to trust her. Like, I think I just need to trust that whatever reason made her run away, that there was something and that that will play out later. And I don't think that Scott Lynch would have put that there if there wasn't some other reason why she ran. So that, that may be reaching, but. No, it depends. Like once you explain it, I'm like, no, like that actually makes perfect more sense. sense. Yeah. Perfect. Not even like more sense, like perfect, like why else would he have said it and done it in the way he did if it wasn't because like it went over my head but once you've said it i'm like no that connects all the dots it makes perfect sense right 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 so i'm excited to see if she comes back we'll, we'll talk about that more in final thoughts but the last thing we have to talk about is the fucking falconer tell me what you think of the falconer coming back with dream steel Oh my God. <laughs> I had just thought in, as I was reading it, like, okay, so we're finally done with them. Like they're not going to be like the main storyline anymore. And especially because like, they are so much of a threat than like anything else that you really can't fight about. Like, okay, this makes sense. Now we can move on from the shit and we're going to get a new storyline and whatever. And that just like ripped open that wound and was like, yeah. no, just kidding. Like, no, like this is going to be the overarching big bad guy yeah the whole thing i understood it but at the same time i just wanted to be done with it <laughs> yeah i i kind of want to be done with the bonds mage as yeah. well it seems like um, a very uneven fight yeah it's a it's a very uneven fight but i think that's what i liked so much about the first yeah. book is that you know so often in fantasy magic is something like a, a guy with a bow and arrow could kill a guy with magic. You know what I mean? But in this, it's like, it is so beyond We're anything. We're so out of your depth. Like. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I kind of I kind of love the, the out of your depth feeling. Um, but I really loved the idea of him going up to this dream steal and being able to turn that into his fingers and his tongue. He's like, now he has everything he needs to be as powerful as he was before and probably even more powerful. Um, and yeah, and then he like, <laughs> then he kills his mom with crows, with literally a murder of crows. I actually felt worse for like the guy who had cared for him for years. Oh, I know, he right? Was, He's like, I didn't do I anything. I'm like, he didn't do anything. He literally cared for you and he, so you wouldn't get bed sores and shit. Yeah. And it looked like his mom was like, oh, your Maddie carried you on a leash? Like, that's what you did to all these like animals and stuff that you, um, so he has the power that like hasn't been seen in 400 years, right? The falconer where yeah. he can take over animals and control them and use them as weapons. And um, I thought it was really interesting when we got the flashbacks where the mom is like, no, if you do this, like every time one of these animals dies, like you're going to feel, feel it. it. Like you died yourself. And I was like, what would that do to a person? What would that do to your brain? Right. Over and over and over again, all of these animals dying and whatnot, especially his falcon is yeah. dead now. So he's he's going to be insane. He's yeah. absolutely going to be insane. He seems like he's figuring out some new power. I feel like he's going to be the next lock or whatever. You know what yeah. I mean? The next <laughs> bad magi. And right. while I am interested in seeing what he'll do, 
unless Locke develops his own powers, I don't understand where this is going to go. Yeah. So, so let's let's go into final thoughts because I think, yeah. um, you know, that that's a little bit what I'm worried about is that in order for Locke to keep up with this Bonds Mage, he he's going to have to develop his powers, and I I think that's why Lynch did it, and I understand that. But I wish it had just been the series of increasingly bigger and bigger cons rather than let's make the bad guys more powerful and have to make Locke more powerful. I yeah. I like the idea of Clock be or Locke being more clever rather than brute force powerful. That that's my thing, is like he can always like weasel his way with his brains out of everything and now he's up against someone that I don't see. Yeah. How you can in any way use just your brains. Like it's right. a very imbalanced fight. Um yeah. so I'd be inter- uh, I feel like it has to go that way. And if it's not I'm like mm, I don't want to understand what you're doing then. <laughs> right. Exactly. I I don't really like it. I I think the only saving grace is that uh, it'll just be fun to see Locke with magical powers. Like it'll just oh, be yeah. like, like if he's super clever without them. Like imagine what he could do with magic. Like it would be yeah. so inventive. It um, reminds me of like Kyler and like the Kakari. Yeah, and, like, all of that kind of stuff. You know, right. like it very much reminds me of that. And I'm hoping. Yeah. That he gets powers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, you know. You know, while while part of me really hates it, I think another part of me is like I trust Scott Lynch so much to like do clever things with the story because he has so far. Um, and so part of me is like maybe I just have to trust him and see what he does with this. Uh, mm-hmm. So I'm I'm really hoping that you know he he comes through with like a really good like well planned out idea for what he's gonna do with this storyline yeah um because and maybe that's why it's taken 10 years to get this book because he knows that if he half asses it and just like makes a magic story then it's just not it's not going to do the same thing that the books are beloved for so well, my question is is what have you been doing for an income for the last 10 years <laughs> you know what i mean like <laughs> Dude, i really don't know like i don't know if it's like is lo- I, like Locke Lamora or Gentleman Bastards is a very, very, very popular series, but is it popular enough for the residuals or, or uh, what are the, whatever they're called to, residuals, yeah. or royalties or whatever royalties, to residuals. like, is that enough to sustain him? Like, I don't, I don't know. I like, I, I could see, I could see King Killer being enough to s- sustain Patrick Rothfuss, but I don't know if Lies of Locke Lamora is enough to sustain Lynch. So I mean, I had technically bought these books because, like, I'd read, like, a ton about them, but I had never picked them off of my shelf until, you know, we decided to do the episodes on it. And yeah. I actually think it started book one a couple times, two or three times before, you know, I had the motivation of the podcast to sure. actually, like, sit down and keep going. Like, it's going to get better. Sorry, guys. We had some technical difficulties there. We're back now. Um <laughs> But yeah, I do. Do you remember what you were saying? What were we talking about? Um, oh, we were saying how can he be living off of the royalties? You know, oh, yes, for the last okay. ten years and whatnot, and um, yeah. uh, that just made me curious because like I hadn't realized when we were reading it that this book had come out ten years ago, and I was like, yeah, whoa, and like ten years to me, like I can understand like a little writer's block and whatnot, but I feel like two years to me is like. <laughs> the most leeway I can give someone. Right, you know, yeah. That, that's kind of the most I can give where I'm like, if you have nothing else going on in your life and this is all you are doing... Yeah, it's not like he's written another series and he's putting books out in that series or anything. Which is what I've been hoping you were going to tell me is like he had started another series because I have a couple authors like that where they yeah. don't finish a series before they start another and then they may intertwine and whatnot, but... Um, I was a little disappointed to learn that the last that this book had come out 10 years ago. I was like, oh, OK. Right. Yeah. I feel and like I, another King Killer, George R. R. Martin, like, am I going to get another book? Right, 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 right. And it, it it's kind of it's kind of sad being at the third book and being like, oh, like I just 
we just don't know like all, all the promises and everything are great but like we just don't really know and i yeah. I, I know that um that scott lynch had gone through some uh like very serious like health concerns and he went through mm-hmm. like i think a divorce or something um and so that it's like wrong? i yeah it's like i i i get it I'm but <laughs> yeah but, but what else like, do you do it yeah, that it that seems to be the thing that happens to like all sorts of authors like like Rothfuss and stuff. It's like, oh, something happens in their personal life and it's like, ah, oh, man, I just wouldn't I just wouldn't be able to say the same like working in construction. I wouldn't be able to be like, oh, I'll take a 10-year break because I had a health concern like Literally, like I sell health insurance for a living and I couldn't be like, "Oh, sorry guys, like for the last 5 years I couldn't get it together to like, you know, renew right. your plan." or get you new insurance policy. <laughs> right, I know. You know, like there's no excuse in our lines of work, but I guess yeah. you know there's a lot more leeway with authors and I absolutely empathize, but um I'm more of a like be honest. Just yeah. fucking be honest about it. Yeah, just tell hey, me where I don't have that. anything written yet. It's going to be another 4 years before you see anything. Like yeah. okay. At least then I know. Yeah. At least then I know. Like yeah. Rothfuss, he loves to like just breadcrumb us so much, and I, know. I used to watch all of his Twitch streams. And then we hit the goal amount, you know, for him to read the first chapter of Doors of Stone, and we've heard fucking nothing from him since then. Right? The fuck? Yeah. I gave him so much leeway and so much credit and grace, and he has just gotten me to the point where I'm like, no, no. Yeah. You've yeah. lied now. You've like straight up lied. Like I'm yeah. done don't care I, yeah. I still want your book but I'm annoyed. yeah right for sure um my last final thought is that Lynch has done this a couple times to us where he gives us a great story of like what could have been like with Esri and then he kills her it's like oh man the the third book would have been so amazing with like Esri joining their group that would have been so awesome yeah. and then with this one it's like oh man imagine Sabatha and Jean and Locke going and doing a, a con in modern day but we're probably not going to get that like we might see her in the next book but it's not like them running off to do a con together yeah um and i'm like man like you had you had like a couple like really like things that could have been really good stories and yeah. you're you're going a different direction with it which you know is possible to be great but i'm like man those like people would have loved those stories like yeah would have loved them yeah i thought that's where it was going what we were leading up to <laughs> yeah but we we can end this on a on a happy note. Are you are you glad that you got through this trilogy and and read all of yeah. them and everything? It's not even like a got through. Like I yeah. I enjoyed this. Like book two was a little bit of a struggle for me, if I'm sure. being honest. But overall, like I very much enjoyed this whole series. I liked the plot points. I liked the you know friendship connections, everything like that. Like I really love. Locke and Jean's relationship and everything they've been through and continue to to get through together. Um, I'm I would really love book four. I would yeah. really love book four. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So I would I would give it a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This this is a series that has been consistently uh, re-readable for me. There's there's very few <laughs> <clears throat> very few series that uh, I go back to reread. Um, I'm a big rereader. I'm like yeah. a huge rereader. <laughs> yeah, I I love to. I just think like if I usually when I'm in the mood to reread something, it's like I need it to be like a comfy read to some extent or something that I get like a lot of joy out of. Uh-huh. Um, and so this has been one where I'm like, I just want to hang out with Locke and John again. I just want to hang out with these two yeah. and yeah. and the other gentleman bastards. Um, and so, yeah, I, I love rereading this and honestly, uh, I know, I know we're busy for the next like month or so, but you have got to read King's Dark Tidings because everything, everything that you enjoyed from these books, you will love about that one. That's, that's the one where the, the first one is Free the Darkness okay. and, and they have really great hardcovers if you like the physical books. Um, I think I have this. I think I have this. Uh, Calcade. I have another Calcade book for sure that I've read. Uh, yeah, that's I her think, other series. I think I have King's Dark Tidings, though. Okay. 
Well, um, I have way too many things to read for us. I know, future, I know. But maybe one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one where you have it scheduled as like a podcast that I'll yeah, be able to Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll schedule it. We'll make it a, a for sure thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, thanks for thanks for reading all three of these books. Like, it's thanks so for fun. doing the it's trilogy not the first with us. Time I've read multiple books for you, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You got Maybe all the way through like, Night read, Angel, like, five or six. <laughs> <laughs> well, Night Angel has three books, but okay, yeah. <laughs> well, no, we read the first three and then the new one. Oh yeah, okay, four, yeah, yeah, four. That's fair. So that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. Uh, but. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, to Harry Potter and and Stormlight so coming up soon. To Harry Potter. <laughs> yeah, we can start reading that uh, as soon as we want. So yeah, I was really upset last time when I finished book two and had to stop to, that, to read these. <laughs> that was weird, right? Because we we finished reading the second book of uh, Gentlemen Bastards, and it was like. Well, we just read Harry Potter. It's like I kind of want to keep going on with Harry yes. Potter, but also <laughs> like the way the way more. Yeah, but the way the second book of Gentleman Bastards ends, yeah. it's like shit, I kind of want to read the third book. Like what do we do? I wanted to read both of them at the same time. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm glad that uh I'm glad we can get back to Harry Potter and just like yeah. stay on that train in between Stormlight Archive books. Yeah, so. my last Mina Lima version. I'm very I know. excited and sad because I really would love to read the Goblet of Fire version. I know, you know? the Goblet of Fire version is exactly. gonna be so cool. Yeah, it's gonna be so awesome. <laughs> Uh, but all right, everyone, that is going to wrap us up for today. Let us know down in the comments what you think of the third installment in the Gentleman Bastard series, and tell us what you think is going to be happening next for Locke and Jean. Tell us your favorite theories that you've crafted over the years, because we would love to hear about those. We've made so many of our own theories today. We'd love to hear yours. Um, but as always, you can reach out to us on our socials, link down below in the description or over on Patreon where you can get exclusive content as well as the ability to watch these episodes live as we record them. Also, don't forget about the bingo card that's linked below. If you fill it out using the instructions, then we will buy the first person to spell bingo a hardcover trilogy of their choosing. And then as far as upcoming content, we have another Harry Potter episode next week, and then we will be starting our read of Way of Kings. We have been waiting to get to this for so long. We're so excited. Um, and now this is probably going to take us a couple weeks to read fully. I think we have, from the time of this recording, we have three full weeks to read it before we actually record the episode. So in the meantime, We'll have a couple weeks of content, including a creator's corner uh, with a new and upcoming YouTuber, and then a live stream where we're gonna talk to a friend in the tech industry about the use of AI as an art form and the potential problems that that poses for the writing and art communities. And you know, just to be clear on this point, we don't really support the use of AI for this kind of stuff. So that's likely the stance that we'll probably all be taking on that live stream. Uh, with maybe a little bit of devil's advocate here and there thrown in just for a good discussion. And then it's our Way of Kings episode, and at some point we will do our 1K subscriber live stream. So we're all really looking forward to what the next couple months have in store, and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for hanging out with us, and until next time, I'm going to go find my own Ash Bastard to chug. Wish me luck. <laughs> And a big shout out to Caitlin. Thank you so much for backing us at the Greenbone tier. Mm -hmm.